Hi and welcome back to yet another video. This is the third episode of the story about the time when Naruto managed to harness the power of nature in his early childhood due to which he was inducted into Anbu. Let's watch as Naruto Uzumaki takes world by storm. After you've finished watching, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Let's get started, the Jonin test had worked spectacularly. Naruto had gained the respect from the Jonin of Konoha, and kept the already present bond with the Anbu. He still needed to prove himself, but he had at least got a chance to do so. He had their respect, now he had to keep it. After the duel was over, Hiruzen and his shadow had retreated back to the Hokage office. Well done Naruto-kun. Hiruzen complimented the blonde. The Lord Third knew the outcome before the test even began, and he expected nothing less from his top shinobi, but it never hurt to compliment someone who was like family. It was a small, almost unimpressive victory considering who he was, but Hiruzen wanted Naruto to know that he cared about him more than a tool. He was not like his cold-hearted rival, he loved all of Konoha's citizens, shinobi included. Speaking of the old war hawk, Gigi ununcovered the mole, Naruto said suddenly, causing the Hokage to become serious and narrow his eyes. He stayed silent, already knowing that Naruto knew to continue. It was Shimura Danzo. He revealed, causing his grandfatherly figure to sigh. Of course it was. Hiruzen trailed off. If the old Sarutobi was honest, he kind of figured as much. His old rival was granted access, among others, to Naruto's Anbu profile when it became publicly known that the Kamikage existed. The village elders didn't pull stunts like leaking information, so Hiruzen had crossed his former teammates off the list. Nara Shikaku, Konoha's Jonin commander and head of the Nara clan was too smart to ever cross the god of Shinobi, so he too was off the list. Kakashi always had access to anything he wanted about Naruto, unless it was classified as Hokage's eyes only, but he was practically the boy's older brother, so he was never even on the list. Yugao was in the same boat with Kakashi. She'd never purposefully sabotage his Anbu career. Her lover, Hayate, would have been discovered before the incident even happened if he was the mole, being around the Yuzumaki so much. Hayuhiyashi knew Naruto was the bringer of hope, but he respected the boy more than any other ninja in the village for what he had done for his daughter, so Hiruzen highly doubted that it was the Hayuga clan head. All of Rohan was exempt as well. If there was someone in his own team that was capable of doing this to him they would have been sniffed out before they had the chance. But if they were a part of Team Ro, and they did try and sabotage his career, Hiruzen just might have promoted the operative. It would take balls of steel to defy their captain. That only really left Danzo. The Foundation's leader was the only man alive who knew enough about Hiruzen's shadow to know that he was the most deadly shinobi alive and still act against him. The thing that ticked the aged Hokage off the most was that the man probably thought that he was doing him a favor. Danzo had, on many occasions, expressed his thoughts on how fear gained respect. If the other villages feared Konoha, they'd be forced to obey. He had successfully created Konoha's own little boogeyman to scare the nations into obedience by leaking the information on Naruto. It was a tactic all of the villages used, but he had acted on his own again. And intentionally, or unintentionally, it didn't really matter, ruined Naruto's life in one way or another. Again. The man just kept digging a bigger grave all the time. Do you wish to take action? Hiruzen continued, somewhat hesitantly. He knew of Naruto's desire to have Sasuke help him take the old man's life, and didn't really have anything against it, but couldn't tell if the blonde could take any more of Danzo's radical moves. No. Naruto replied quickly. Sasuke deserves to help with that scum's end. Naruto smirked. Dying at the hands of a Nuchiha, such poetic justice was appealing to the Jinchuriki. I can wait for as long as it takes, he continued. This actually works out to my advantage, he chuckled. Hiruzen raised an eyebrow. Oh? Please, do tell. This ought to be good. Danzo just gave me a legitimate excuse to help Sasuke become strong enough to kill him faster, he chuckled again. He's helping me kill him. The irony was almost too much to handle. I guess you have a point. The San Daime replied. He didn't necessarily disapprove of Naruto's decision to kill his old rival, but that didn't mean he had to enjoy it as much as the boy did. He never judged his shadow, but he didn't always share his interests. It was hard to understand the way a monster thought, after all. If it was anyone else who actually smiled at the thought of killing another Konohanin, Hiruzen would have them evaluated, and then thrown into prison. Naruto, however, was the one exception, he wore the title of monster proudly on his chest, never hiding what he was. There were no secrets between the two, either. Hiruzen knew everything the blonde thought and felt. 
The Lord Third was so confident in the boy that he was already selected to become the acting Hokage if anything ever happened to him. And the fact that his shadow never did anything without the Hokage's permission was also a factor. If Hiruzen told him no, he would not act against his leader. He had absolute control over the Jinchuriki, and it made the Uzumaki respect him even more that he wasn't treated like a slave. He actually had a say in what he did or didn't do. So, what now, Jigi? Naruto asked, eager to know what he was going to be assigned to as a Jonin. Do I get to lead Jonin, Chunin, or Jonin now? He had absolutely no idea what he was going to do outside of Anbu, but he decided that he might as well give it a shot and be as optimistic about it as possible. Hiruzen smirked, bringing his pipe up to his mouth. Oh, I have the perfect assignments for you, Naruto-kun. Naruto narrowed his eyes. His Gigi had a distinctive mischievous feeling about him, and the blind didn't like it one bit. Which is? He asked after the old man didn't reply, You will be given your assignments tomorrow, Joni Nuzumaki. Now leave my office, I have paperwork to get to. Naruto growled at his commander, half playfully, half annoyed, but did as he was told. The Sarutobi was up to something, and Naruto was not looking forward to the answer he would be receiving tomorrow. He could only hope it wasn't totally horrible. Hiruzen chuckled to himself quietly when he knew Naruto was a decent distance away. His assignment wasn't actually all that bad, but he had wanted the boy to think it would be. Let it be known that Sarutobi Hiruzen could still pull one over on the bringer of hope. Naruto was a bit annoyed with his Hokage's sudden tight-lipped attitude. The aged warrior was the only person alive who could keep anything away from him. It only applied to matters that were of minuscule importance, so he never got too worked up about it, but it still got on his nerves a little. When he left the Hokage's office, Naruto had taken up to walking around Konoha's D Avenue. While in the Anbu he had little time to appreciate a lot of the village because of his busy schedule. Now, finally with some downtime, which he considered the Jonin rank as, he was able to check out some of the shops in his home. He had already been to Ijiraku Ramen, the greatest restaurant known to man in his opinion, before he joined the Black Ops, and it was still his favorite, but he wanted to try something different. He had at least been to Shashuya's, and knew of the kind of food they sold there. He had never seen such large plates in his life. The blonde really wanted to go there again and actually eat this time. He'd make you gao treat him there next time he did something worth a meal. He was currently heading to a place called Amaguriyama, a sweet shop in the heart of the T Avenue. He was told by Uma and Yusagi that they sold Konoha's best curries in Zai. He had never tried chestnuts and a sweet bean paste soup made from crushed red beans before, but he was eager to try it out. Most children loved sweets and the like, but with his mature mind and knowledge of healthy eating, he had skipped the entire candy phase and went right into the eating for a better self phase. Both Kakashi and Yu Gao were always telling him that he needed to act more his age and try out new younger people things. What's more young teen than buying sweets? Amiguriyama was close, and the smells throughout the D Avenue were amazing. Nothing smelled bad or bitter, nothing smelled like blood or death, and it was wonderful to get away from it all, he realized. From this day forth, whenever he thought about peaceful times, he would remember this enticing aroma. This is what peace smelled like, if anything. Before he reached the sweets shop however, he felt them. They were calling out to him, asking for him to come. He smiled. He had hoped he could give them a proper goodbye. They all deserved one. With an unseen gesture, Naruto had told them where to meet him. Anbu code was one of the most useful things he had ever learned, right up there with his and his Hokage's secret chakra burst code. No one had even noticed when he shunshined, body flickered, in the middle of the street, fading from the D Avenue like he was never there. It used to surprise his team, his ability to fade away so inconspicuously, but after working with him for so long they had just chalked it up to something else the boy wonder could do. It only took Naruto 5 minutes to arrive in training ground 44, his former Anbu team hot on his heels. The Forest of Death was a regular meeting place for Team Ro, it being so secluded from the village made it the perfect place for privacy and secrecy, both very important factors in the life of an Anbu. He settled on the forest floor so that his entire team could look at him. He could feel their minds, most of them were not pleased. Niko, Saru, Uma, Risu, Ushi, Okami, and Ryan suddenly appeared on the branches above him. Niko and Saru had already come to terms with their captain's retirement, not exactly loving the idea, but accepting it nonetheless. He knew the two operatives, especially Niko, wanted nothing more than for him to stay, but respected the decision of their captain and Hokage. When it came to the Anbu Black Ops, emotions were never something expressed all that much. This meant that the blonde had to do all of the talking, i.e. the mushy mush. Niko, 
I appreciate your acceptance, and I know that you will be a great captain. Nico's heart skipped a beat, making Naruto smile. Which is why I've recommended you as my successor. He finished happily. His sister was giving off waves of gratitude and respect. Most of the time, when Anbu captains retire, they only announce their successor to the Hokage, letting it be a surprise to their squad. However, in Rohan, Naruto wasn't the only different one. It had been made clear early on in Naruto's command that the entire team hated surprises, so the young Jinchuriki never held his tongue when it came to big, non-classified information. You'll do me proud, I know it. He added before moving on. Saru. Naruto began. You big pervert. He heard the Nara sigh. I think I might even miss you, he chuckled, the only person to laugh at his joke. He had laughed with his team before, but Naruto was a strict captain. When they wore the mask, they were Anbu, nothing more, nothing less. Anbu did not laugh. The blonde, however, was no longer in the core, and his mask was no longer a part of him, so he was free to laugh as much as he wanted. Keep supporting your captain with brilliant strategies, and never change. He gave a warm smile. You wouldn't be the same if you didn't hit on every woman you come in contact with. Naruto could have sworn he heard Nico snort. And listen to Nico. She may be a bit bossy, he could feel his Nei-chan's eyes narrow behind her mask, but she'll keep you alive. He looked at the rest of the Anbu. She'll keep you all alive. Uma, I'll never forget your kindness. He started. Or your willingness to teach me some of the Hyuga's techniques. He really loved his new arsenal of tricks, and it wouldn't have been possible without the horse-masked operative. The promise I made to you still counts. He added, reassuring the woman that he would do what he had sworn. The Hyuga main and branch families would be united as one when he became the Hokage, he'd make sure of that. Once he was done, the entire clan would be freed from their cages, no more imprisoned second-class clansmen. He felt the Hyuga woman's mind, she believed anything and everything that came out of his mouth. He next turned to Risu, the only other blonde on the team. The young woman was his genjutsu specialist, and a Yamanaka to boot. Risu. He almost huffed. Try and cool it with all the fooling around with men. He really didn't like how dirty the woman's mind could be. When he had joined Rohan he was almost victim to the man-eater, until Yugao scared her something fierce. That was one of the times he was glad to have such an annoyingly overprotective sister. There's someone out there who is just waiting to tame you, I'm sure of it. The woman purred underneath her mask at Naruto suggestively before Nico cleared her throat, causing the blonde, squirrel masked operative to stand down. Until that man braves that suicide mission though, Nico will be able to keep you in check. He almost felt bad for the woman, her emotions were that of depression. Now she'd never get laid. Naruto had a strange relationship with Ushi. The ox masked operative was a giant of a man, and bald, very bald. The Hokage had placed him on Naruto's team to see if the blonde could handle the handful that was Ushi. He had been placed on six different teams before he was given to Rohan, and it wasn't because he was so amazing and everyone wanted to share. He only listened to people who were physically stronger than him, and even just by looking at the size of his muscles, one could tell that his brute strength was beyond the human norm. It was a good thing that Naruto was ten times stronger than any shinobi in Konoha when he wasn't trying, or he might have had trouble as well. Ushi. Niko is in charge from this point on until you are told otherwise by the Hokage, is that clear? He commanded. The berserker grunted in affirmation, causing Niko to let out a quiet sigh in relief. She hadn't a clue what she would have done with the tank if she was left to give him orders by herself. Apparently her little brother felt her nervousness and, like always, came to the rescue. Okami was always a relaxed, calm person, so when he only showed mild irritation at his captain's forced retirement, Naruto knew that it was his way of stating that he was thoroughly pissed. Okami, you do the title proud, my friend. Okami was a man of great honor and loyalty, so for his captain to compare him to that of the honorable wolf, he was grateful beyond words. He was lucky that his now former leader didn't need such annoying things as words. Keep my sister safe. He added, knowing full well that after him, the wolf-masked man was the strongest of the team. He was the oldest as well and a skilled swordsman that made Hayate and Niko a little jealous. Okami nodded, taking his words like he would any other order the young shinobi would give him. Like he was still his captain. The last person Naruto confronted was Ryan. The lion-masked man was the most awkward person the Uzumaki had ever met. He couldn't talk to women, at all, unless it was Niko, Risu, or Uma, and only because Naruto had beaten it into him to communicate with them. 
It was sad at first to the men of the team, he couldn't flirt with the wonderful female species, until it became blatantly obvious that the brown-haired man was only interested in other men. Naruto didn't judge, but made it clear where his and the other men's interests were. I hope working under a woman will help you get over your fear of females, he said with a genuine smile. It was a pleasure working with you. He closed his eyes. He could feel his team's hearts. It was a pleasure working with all of you. He finally said, opening his eyes to a sight he always loved looking at. The assembled seven Anbu had their right fist on their hearts, and when he opened his eyes, they brought their fist to the sky, Team Rose personal salute. It conveyed everything their words could not. We will always respect you, Captain. Naruto let a small, genuine smile cross his face before he too brought his fist to his heart before touching the sky with it. As I will respect all of you, he whispered. He knew they heard him, and he knew they didn't care if he practically read their minds. He was the bringer of hope, the Kamikage, he was Nezumi Teiko, and he was the only person alive who they trusted fully with their minds. He had their undying loyalty. And they had his. Naruto cleared his throat. Now. He began in his Anbu voice. Leave. He smirked. Go and protect your village. The seven Anbu stood up straight with a stomp of their feet before simultaneously shouting, Yes, sir. And like that, the members of Anbu Unit Rohan disappeared, gone to complete the orders of their captain. He'd always be their leader. Naruto had gone back to Amaguriyama to try out the Kuri Zenzai, and was pleasantly surprised that he actually enjoyed it. He never really ate sweets, but he would definitely come back to try other foods. It was a little awkward for him to walk the streets of Konoha without his mask. It felt like he was three years old again, just waiting for someone to approach him. No one ever did, but that was beside the point. He was torn again. On one hand, he was happy to be amongst his people, his village, but on the other, he was nervous around them. He did not wish to be rejected, and he most certainly would not allow anyone to beat him again. He was too far past that to continue. If they had a problem, they'd have to take it up with the Hokage. After Amaguriyama, Naruto had gone home to try and figure out what he was missing with his sage dust, but after two hours of fruitless meditation he had given up and went to bed early. He had nothing else to do, and he was eager to learn the details of his newest assignment. The next day saw him with a few familiar faces in the Hokage's office. Hiruzen had summoned them here for some unknown reason, and Naruto could almost taste the awkwardness in the room. He had hoped that the Jonin he fought weren't bitter about their loss, but it seemed like that would be the case. Now that you're all here, the Lord Third began, I can debrief you on what I am assigning to Jonin Uzumaki Naruto, said Blonde raised an eyebrow. He could faintly feel his Gigi's playfulness towards him, and he had the odd sensation that he had been played somehow. Lord Hokage, why do we have to be present for Naruto-san's assignment? Asked an irritated Asuma. Once again, he was pulled away from time with Kurenai because of his father. Because his assignment involves the four of you. The older Sarutobi replied, As you all know, there will be new Jana teams formed, and the four of you already know who will be assigned to you. Seeing the understanding nods from his shinobi, Hiruzen continued. All of you have let her have been in teams with Janan, Chunin, and Jonin before. You know how to work with lower ranked ninja, and how you're supposed to guide them. The Hokage turned to Naruto. Naruto-kun, however, has been in the Yanbu Black Ops since he was four, and has absolutely no experience with lower ranked shinobi. Naruto nodded. So I've decided to attach him to you four. He will rotate between your teams and learn how to properly work with Janan, Chunin, and Jonin. Everyone besides Naruto and Kakashi were surprised. The boy had destroyed them in the duel yesterday, and now the Hokage was saying that he needed to learn from them? All four Jonin turned to the blonde when he cleared his throat. I look forward to learning many great things from all of my senpais, he said politely, and gave them all a respectful bow. Kakashi was the first to reply. I can't wait to work with you again, Kohai he said with an eye smile. Just like old times. He finished, rubbing the top of Naruto's head, gaining a small laugh and smile from his little brother. Yes, senpai, Naruto said. I can't wait. He was genuinely happy to once again be under the copy nin. He may not be as strong as him, but Kakashi still had full authority over him. Hotake Kakashi was the Kamikage's captain, and he always would be. The lazy pervert had a godlike 15-year-old at his beck and call. I? Kurin I began. I look forward to it as well, Naruto-san. It took her a moment to process that she was going to help train the bringer of hope, but she finally snapped out of her daze and spoke up. She received a smile and a nod from the boy, 
which strengthened Yu Gao's claims that her brother was a very humble and kind boy when he wanted to be respectful to his subordinates, and terrifying to his enemies. It really hurt the Genjutsu mistress's head when she thought about how complex the boy was. Asuma sighed, but finally relented. I don't know what I could possibly give you. The younger Sarutobi began. But I'll try my best to help as well. Naruto could tell that even though he was a little bothered by it, he was truly going to do his best for a fellow Konohanin. That alone earned him the respect of the Kamikage. Thank you, Asuma-san was all that Naruto said to the chain-smoking Jonin. Yos, yelled the green-clad ninja with a bowl cut. I will help brighten your flames of youth, Naruto-san. Naruto smiled at Guy's antics. He would have a fun time with the Taijutsu specialist, that he was absolutely certain. I can't wait, Guy-san, Naruto said with equal gusto. Kakashi shook his head and leaned in real close to his rival. If you put any kind of spandex on my kohai, I'll accident you. The silver-haired man said deathly serious, Understood? He asked, daring the man to say anything but what he wanted to hear. Guy gulped. I promise, no spandex. Kakashi didn't move a muscle for a good 10 seconds for good measure. After the 10 seconds were over, he gave the man an eye smile like he hadn't just threatened him and nodded. Glad to hear it, he said before pulling away from his friend of many years. Hiruzen chuckled. Why were all of his joining so strange? Was he like that too when he was young? No, I was normal, am normal. He thought to himself smugly. He raised his head to speak with his shinobi. Now that you all know, you are dismissed, he stated as he picked up his pen to get started on his mountain of paperwork. One by one, the Jonin walked out of the Hokage's office. When they were down the stairs, the four older shinobi turned to face their newest Jonin in arms. How's lunch with your new subordinates sound, Kohai? Kakashi asked, reaching into his back waist pouch to pull out his porn. Guys buying. He added quickly. Guy held his fist to the air. Damn the gods for making you so cool and hip, Kakashi. The blue beast roared. Apparently, Kakashi had won their last little competition, and that meant that Guy had to pay for the lunch. Naruto shrugged. Sounds good. I was just going to go home and train for the rest of the day, but lunch sounds fine. He smiled when he felt his senpai's mind. It Jirakus it is. The copy nin stated, getting a smile from not only the blonde, but Kurinai as well. Not many people knew that the Genjutsu specialist liked Ichiraku's ramen as much as he did, but like everyone else, she couldn't hide it from Naruto. He smirked. Yeah, he'd get along just fine with these people. Week 1, Maito Guy. It was the day of the Janan team announcement, and all of the young, freshly minted shinobi were excited to meet their Jonin sensei. Most of the year's academy graduates were from the clans of Konoha, and most of them were the heirs and heiresses of said clans. It looked like a good crop this year and Naruto was almost as excited as the Janan. Since he could remember, he loved to learn new things. His innate ability to feel every living thing around him made him an extremely curious person, so when he had the chance to learn something new, he always jumped for it. Being attached to four different Jonin to observe their teaching methods would most definitely teach him new and different things. What those things were, he had no idea, and he really didn't care. As long as it helped him in his crucible to gain the strength to keep his village safe, he learned them. The rotation schedule was decided when they had lunch at Ichiraku's. Since Kakashi, Asuma, and Kuranai would be receiving new teams, they needed to have a few private sessions before they could introduce Naruto into the mix, and having the bringer of hope around to observe their Janan test would make the green Janan so nervous they wouldn't have a fair chance to prove themselves. So, Guy had volunteered to take the first shift. Since he had been with his team for an entire year already, the transition would be smoother. After Guy, he'd move on to Asuma, and then to Kakashi, and Kurinai would be the last. He'd only spent two weeks with each Jonin, but that was more than enough for Naruto. He could have observed them for only a day and be able to replace them, and no one would even know, but he wasn't going to argue with spending more time with them. They were starting to become his friends, and Naruto wanted everyone in Konoha to see him like that, friendly. He was a monster, but meant no harm to his birthplace whatsoever. Naruto really wanted to watch the Janan meet their new instructors, but he had somewhere else to be. Training Ground 9 was Team Guy's regular meeting place. It had many trees, which helped every member of the team out in one way or another. When Naruto had arrived he was aware that he was the last one to show up. He knew for a fact he was on time, so he chalked it up to the rest of them being early. He would soon find out that his guess was true. Guy caught Naruto's arrival in the corner of his eye, and ordered everyone to stop whatever they were doing. 
The three Shinan assembled around their sensei just in time to see Naruto heading right for them. Who's that, sensei? A girl with her hair up in two buns asked. A spy? A boy with long black hair asked in an accusing voice. Naruto gave Guy a face that said help me out here, and was relieved when he was saved. No, Neji-kun, Guy began, he is a friend of mine. He brought his thumb up to point at the blonde who had arrived. This, my youthful students, is Uzumaki Naruto, he said in a grandiose voice. The three Shinan looked at him like he was wearing a green, skin-tight spandex suit. Clearly confused at the over-the-top introduction. Guy shook his head. Ah, uh, you wouldn't know him by his real name yet, would you? He asked rhetorically. I apologize. He started again. This shinobi, is the bringer of hope. Konoha's Kaomikich, Guy shouted as he fist pumped into the heavens. For what felt like an eternity, Lee, Tenten, and Neji just stood there, frozen in shock and awe, before Tenten shook from her surprised state of mind and entered one of non-belief. Sure, Guy sensei the aspiring weapons specialist said in a sarcastic tone. And I'm Tsunade I'm of the Sanin. Naruto smiled and reached out his hand to shake the Kunoichi's. Your sensei is not lying, Kunoichi-san. He began. I was given the moniker bringer of hope by Mizu no Kuni, he stated. And Kamikage just kind of snuck up on me. Lord Hokage refers to me as his shadow, and one of his monikers is the god of Shinobi, so the other Anbu put two and two together and, well, you know the rest he said with a genuine smile. He knew the girl still didn't believe him. But he was going to try and make a good impression nonetheless. Guy sensei, is he really the Kamikage? The guy lookalike asked in excitement. Naruto now knew why his captain threatened the Jonin if green spandex came anywhere near him. Apparently, the man liked to have mini-me's. Yes, Lee Kun. Guy replied with just as much excitement. He is. The obvious Hyuga stepped closer to the blonde. Uzumaki-san, was it? He asked, getting a nod from Naruto. It is an honor to meet you. He reached out and grabbed the hand offered to Tenten. I am Hayuga Neji. He finished as he shook the legend's hand firmly. Nice to meet you too, Neji-san. He replied. And you can call me Naruto, if you want. He added, wanting to establish a less formal bond between a possible future teammate. The green beast of Konoha was the next to speak. Yosh. I'm Rock Lee and I'm going to be the best Taijutsu specialist the world has ever seen," he yelled with confidence. Naruto could feel the boy's determination and smiled. He was going to complete his goal or die trying. The will of fire burns strong within you, Lee San. He replied, I'm honored that I can witness your rise to the top. Naruto was a little thrown off when the green-clad boy took out a little pad and pencil from seemingly nowhere and began to write enthusiastically, but once he felt that it was normal behavior from the others, he shrugged it off. Wait. The Kunoichi said hesitantly. You're actually the bringer of hope? She asked. Naruto nodded and offered her his hand again. Yeah, but the name's Naruto. It's nice to meet you. He kept his happy smile the entire time he spoke, causing the girl to blush a little. Whether it was because she thought he was cute, or because of his legendary hero status, no one but Naruto and her would ever know. Her mind was easy to read. It was both. She shyly shook his hand and nodded. Oh okay. Naruto-san. Her voice was lower and more subdued. I'm Tenten. She finished, letting go of his hand. Naruto-san here will be attached to Team Guy for a couple of weeks. Guy announced, getting his three students to widen their eyes in shock. He will be observing our regular training routines and how I lead so that he can start leading his own Janan soon. After he finished, he stroked a nice guy pose, which confused Naruto greatly. This man was different, that's for sure, but Naruto liked different. It kept things interesting. Why does he have to watch you to know how to lead a team, Sensei? Tenten asked. Wasn't the Kamika Janonbu captain? Naruto decided to answer this one. I've only lead trained and experienced Onbu operatives, Tenten san. He explained. I haven't the slightest clue how to properly lead and guide lower ranked shinobi. If I was given a Janon team, I wouldn't know how to teach them. If I had a Chunin cell to lead, I would expect too much from them. Even if I had to lead a Jonin cell, it would be difficult for me. Anbu are specialized for high-risk missions, and because of that, know the proper protocol for anything that may or may not happen if I'm busy with something. Most Jonin are specialized in one or two categories, and don't know everything I, and the rest of the Anbu, do. That's why Lord Hokage has asked some of the Jonin to teach me how I'm supposed to deal with it all. After the detailed explanation, he received nods from all of the Jinan. He knew that they now fully understood. 
Well, what are we waiting for? Guy boomed. We're in the springtime of our youth. No time like the present. Naruto smiled at his enthusiasm, and even laughed when it was mirrored by Lee. He was going to have fun with these people. Week 2, Mido Guy. During the first week of observing Guy and his team, Naruto became aware of many things. The first thing he realized was that teaching Shinon took a whole lot of time. Unlike him, the low-ranking shinobi's learning curve was irritatingly slow. Even the simplest of things took the Shinon of Team Guy an entire day or two to learn. It was eye-opening, he really was an incredibly fast learner. The second thing he learned was that Rock Lee was probably one of the most inspirational shinobi he knew. The Shinon was always training in Taijutsu, but Naruto had just thought that it was a phase. When he actually felt the boy's chakra system, he had been shocked at how underdeveloped it was. He was told by Guy that Lee aspired to be a Taijutsu master because it was the only shinobi art he could use. Naruto had sparred with the Green Beast a few times already, and to be told that it was all brute strength and plain Taijutsu was awe-inspiring. Lee was one of the hardest working shinobi Naruto had met, and he had only just started his shinobi career a year ago. The boy had the potential to become legendary, and Naruto was going to make sure he was there to see it. Tenten was actually a lot better with shuriken jutsu than Naruto thought she'd be. The young Kunoichi used a clever tactic that involved basic few and jutsu to launch the weapons at her targets. It didn't look like it would be very effective at first glance, but the stubborn Janan made it work. Her accuracy was impressive as well, which should have been extremely difficult. Apparently, whenever she couldn't hit her target she'd just bombard it with everything she had. It was overkill, but effective overkill. He hadn't spent much time with Neiji, the Hyuga prodigy was always either training by himself, or with his cousin. Naruto didn't know which cousin he meant, what with the Hyuga clan having so many relatives. For all Naruto knew he could have 10, maybe even 20 cousins. He didn't give it too much thought though. His assignment was to observe the proper way to lead lower ranked shinobi, and he had done that. During the second week, Naruto had even joined Rock Lee in his morning workouts, which, anyone other than Naruto would call extreme. The things he did with the aspiring Taijutsu specialist were, for lack of a better word, crazy. Even with the blonde Zonbu trained body, his muscles ached a little after every session. He had even taken to wearing the same weights Lee had around his legs. They were incredibly useful, and Naruto had gotten used to them after the first day. When he took them off, he'd be even faster than he already was which pleased the Uzumaki to no end. He had the yellow flash as a father, he needed every bit of help he could get when it came to speed. The entire second week was beneficial to him in many ways. He had gained the wisdom of a teacher who thought that hard work and discipline made greatness, and if his team was anything to go by, Naruto had to agree. Guy's students were top rate Janan, borderline Chunin, and it had a lot to do with their sensei. Naruto honestly learned more than how to lead Janan during his time attached to Team Guy, though. He had increased his strength, stamina, and speed in just two weeks with Guy and his apprentice. Even after he rotated to Asuma he most likely would keep showing up to their morning training sessions whenever he could. He had made bonds outside of the Anbu, and he held them just as close to his heart as the others. Konoha was slowly accepting him, and he loved her even more for it. The training with Mido Guy had passed by quickly, and Naruto had learned so much from the man. He was almost positive that he worked his Janan harder than anyone else, but it had made the three shinobi better. The blonde was taught that patience was a key factor when teaching Janan. They did not learn as fast as he did, so they warranted more attention, more guidance. Discipline, patience, and a whole lot of hours were required in training the lower-ranked ninja, and Naruto was sure that he'd learned something new and different from his next senpai. Sarutobi Asuma was the Lord Third Hokage's son, and, as expected, was a skilled shinobi. He had made Jonin fairly early in his career, and was even inducted into the Twelve Guardians, where he protected the Fire Daimyo with the other top-notch shinobi in Hai no Kuni. Naruto knew that his Gigi and Asuma didn't really get along all that well, and that having someone the man considers a grandson attached to him and his team would annoy him a little. The Uzumaki was just glad that he was actually going to try his best to help him in his quest to becoming a better teacher. Naruto was touched that everyone from Team Guy were upset from him having to leave so soon, even Nagi. He had offered a lot of pointers to the entire team, even helping Guy with whatever he could. Lee had benefited the most from the whole thing. He finally had someone who was capable of handling his never-stop personality. With Neiji, he would hold back, not wanting to reveal all of his secrets to his rival. With Naruto, he had the perfect training partner. There was no holding back, and Lee was able to test his more lethal moves. 
Tenten had used him as a target dummy for the two weeks they knew each other. She had claimed that he was fast enough that he wouldn't, or shouldn't, get hurt, and that it would help her reaction time. The blonde had seriously questioned her logic, but played his role nonetheless. If it helped his fellow Konoha Nin better protect the village, he'd let her stick him a few times, if that's what she needed. The last two days, Neji had really taken to Naruto, and even though it took him so long to warm up to him, he was glad the boy opened up. Sparring with a Hyuga genius was always fun, and that's exactly what Neji was, a genius. The young Hyuga had mastered many of the main house's techniques of his clan, even though he was a branch member, Naruto having been told that bit of personal information by Guy. When he saw the Zhenan launch the crippling Hakiraku Juai own show, 8 trigram 64 palms, at him during one of their private spars, he was actually surprised. The maneuver was an extremely advanced one, and the Hyuga prodigy did it flawlessly. When Naruto had flared his chakra to the point of visibly being encased in it, and reopening his tenketsu, Neji was shocked into silence. He had just stood there, taken the deadly blows, and looked like nothing had happened afterwards. It kind of scared the Zhenan, but he quickly reassured himself that the Kamikage was as loyal as Shinobi get, and after getting to know him, realized he was kind, when he wanted to be. Naruto had made it perfectly clear that he was no poster child for kindness or the like, and that he was Konoha's monster, her demon slayer, her sword and shield. He didn't want people to get the wrong idea about him just because he was being friendly with them. The day before his rotation, Guy had approached Naruto, asking if they could speak in private. Naruto was a little hesitant at first, but agreed shortly after, already trusting the man after spending two weeks with him. What is it you'd like to talk about, Guy-san? The blonde asked politely. He could feel the man's mind, but it was rude to end a conversation that was serious in nature just because you already knew what was going to be said. Naruto-san, Guy began, in the two weeks you've been assigned to me, I've probably learned more from you than you have from me. The tone and the way that Daijutsu specialist spoke to him was something the blonde had never witnessed before. Gun was the goofy, eccentric handsome devil, and in his place stood a serious shinobi of Konoha. I know that the assignment was to better your teaching skills, but if I didn't know better, I'd think the Lord Hokage sent you here for different reasons. Let it be known the mitre guy was not the complete idiot everyone thought him to be. Naruto gave a small chuckle. Then it's a good thing you know better. He replied, leaning against the tree he was closest to. Guy had brought him into the forests of training ground 9, so said trees were in great numbers. But let's say you didn't know better, what would you think the Lord Hokage's true intentions were, attaching me to the Jinan teams I mean? He really wanted to see how perceptive his fellow Jonin was. I'd say he's trying to get you access to a certain someone without letting other certain someones know about it. Guy smirked. And the rest of the Jinan squads are just a cover, so that the third party doesn't see what's truly going on. That's when Naruto knew that Mido Guy was brilliant. Not only was he far more perceptive than most trained Anbu, but he hid it behind a wall of, well, green spandex. The real mystery though, is why it's such a big secret. If Naruto didn't know the man so thoroughly, he would have taken him into the Hokage, where he would face whatever their leader commanded. He did know the man, however, and knew where his loyalties were. Guy was very close with Kakashi, the two were best friends after all, and that meant that the spandex-clad man knew more than most. He knew that Itachi was a member of Team Ro, alongside Naruto, and most likely knew that they were at the very least close. It was common sense that the two youngest members would become friends quickly, being so outnumbered by older, more experienced adults. So, Guy knew that losing him would have been hard for the boy, no matter who he was. He was still human, despite popular belief, and the loss of someone close to you hurts. When he began to think about the odd assignment, he realized that it was strange. Given his close history with Kakashi, all the Lord Third had to do was assign him to that team, and that team only. He'd learn everything he would need with just him. That meant that there was a reason he couldn't just be given to Kakashi, or at least that was what Guy had concluded. Naruto just smiled. The man was a Jonin after all. Hiruzen knew that it would have caused trouble if he gave Naruto to Kakashi's team, knowing that Donzo would become suspicious. Naruto knew the truth, and Donzo knew he did. He also knew that Naruto and Itachi were close, meaning that he was less than pleased with the outcome of the Uchiha massacre. If he was suddenly spending all of his time with Itachi's little brother, it would have at least caused Donzo to be cautious. The old Warhawk didn't survive this long because he was extremely powerful, he was strong, just not the stuff of legends. He was the most secretive, paranoid, underhanded man the Hokage knew. If he caught even a scent of Naruto's plans for him that involved Sasuke, 
he'd strike at Naruto before the blonde had a chance to. Something like that would force Naruto's hand, and he would have to kill the root leader. The Uzumaki would not allow him to act on his own with radical action anymore, he could only take so much. Well, that is possible, Naruto said, surprising guy. It's a shame you'll never know. Guy caught the Yule instead of we, insinuating that he already knew the real reasoning. Naruto felt the man's mood darken a little at that. So he decided to make it perfectly clear to the Jonin. Gai-san, whatever the case may be, I have truly enjoyed studying under you. His smile was genuine. Not only have you taught me new things, but I've made bonds with people near my own age. That's more than I've accomplished in years done in just two weeks. He took in a deep breath. As long as I take breath in this world, your students will be safe, this I promise you. I will protect them with my life, like I will protect you, because no matter what else happens, I love my village and her people. His smile turned a little dark. I'm a monster, Gaisan. You'll soon see what I'm capable of. And when you do, you'll know that I can keep my promise to you. He looked right into Guy's eyes, blue meeting brown and said, and I never go back on my word, that's my Nindo, my ninja way. Guy had originally asked to speak with Naruto to see if his thoughts about the real reason he was attached to so many Jinna teams were true, and then to warn him to never use his students for his own purposes again, no matter how small or innocent it was. But after speaking with him, after hearing what he had to say, for some reason, Guy had lost all hostility towards him. So this is the real bringer of hope, huh? Guy thought as he looked at the teen in front of him. Not 10 seconds later he went straight back to his exuberant self and fist pumped into the air. Yosh! Our flames of youth still burn brightly together then, Naruto-kun. Naruto didn't miss the change from the more formal san to the personal kun. It was Guy's way of saying that he believed him, and they were no longer just comrades, but friends as well. Now, before you leave us, we should find Lee Kun and run 50 laps around the entire village, on our hands. The blonde smiled. He had found another person he could count on. He had made another friend, the Lady Fifth Music Kage side. She was currently facing a foe that every cage had to face, no matter which village they were from. Paperwork. The thrice damned blight against all things holy was really starting to get on the beautiful, auburn-haired woman's nerves. She never knew that being Mizukage meant that she had to sit in a stuffy office for hours upon hours every day, going through annoyingly large amounts of paper that only seemed to increase with each passing moment. May had a lot on her mind lately. The source of her mind's restlessness? One Uzumaki Naruto, the boy who she had, unknowingly, come to care for far more than she should have. When he was in Mizu no Kuni, he was only 10, and had managed to do multiple things that were considered close to impossible. He had practically won the civil war by himself shortly after joining her and the other insurgents. He had raised an impregnable prison to the ground with ease, freeing all those held captive. He had let himself be taken to the heart of enemy territory and single-handedly brought down a cage-level Jinchuriki, without even damaging the hidden village they had started their death match in. He had freed the entire country, and only asked that they became allied with his home. And the most impossible thing he had done while joining the resistance, he had stolen the heart of Terumi Mei. It started out as just curiosity. He had shown incredible strength when he tore into Black Harbor, and if there was something she respected most in people, it was their strength. It was what attracted her, and the blonde Anbu operative had power in bulk. She wasn't an arrogant person, but even she knew that she was extremely beautiful, so when the boy had declined her offer of a little touchy-feely time, she was a little surprised, and if she were honest, he only interested her more. After he had explained to her his reasons, she had understood and moved on to finding other ways to get close to him. When he accepted her offer to lock lips, she was strangely excited. He was incredibly young, a legal adult, yes, but still young, so she didn't understand her eagerness to be more than friends. After everything he had done for her and her people, she had developed even stronger feelings for him, and when he left, she was more disappointed than she thought she'd be. She had become the leader of her nation, and he was the right hand of the leader of his, and not to mention the huge age difference. They could never work, and yet, Mei couldn't stop thinking about him. He was the most famous person in Mizu no Kuni, the bringer of hope, their savior. Even if she wanted to forget about him, her country wouldn't let her. His name was whispered all throughout the village, the island, the country. There were plays about his heroic deeds, there were books about his courageous work in water country and there were songs sung to the heavens about his godlike gifts. He was what every man aspired to be, and what every woman aspired to be with. Soon after he left, the stories of the Kamikage had made it to Mizu. Suffice to say that he became even more popular, and it was harder for Mei to forget about him. 
He was special, he was different, and he was out of her reach. May sighed again and dropped her pen, taking a break. She reached into her top desk drawer and pulled out a small black book. It was the bingo book Naruto was in, and it held a piece of paper that she didn't absolutely want to burn. Before he left, Naruto wrote her a letter, and put it on her bedside table for her to read it when he was gone. She read it every day, like she was right now. May, these past weeks were fun for me. I've enjoyed spending what little time we've spent together. To be honest with you, I don't have many people I can be close with. It's almost sad, really. I can count the people I can trust with my heart on one hand. When I came to Mizu, I hadn't planned that I would meet someone like you. I was pleasantly surprised that I did. I know I'm young, and I know that it's ridiculous, but I feel more for you than any other person I've ever met. Trust me when I say that I understand love, I've felt the people around me fall in and out of it plenty of times. It's just the first time I think that I've felt it for myself, through my own eyes instead of another's. I kind of wish I was older, and that you were born in Konoha, with me. I know that we probably will never be together, but I just want you to know that, if it's okay with you, the very next time I see you, we'll continue what you started the night we first shared a bed together. Even now, writing it down, I can feel you blushing. Good. I hope every time you read this that it makes you blush, so you can remember me. Please. Please don't forget me, May. I want a place in your heart forever, even if you find someone else, even if you move on. That's all I ask for, a place to call my own. You will always be in my heart and mind, May Chan, and if your country needs me again, say the word, and I'll have my God send his angels to rescue you. I know women like you, powerful women, don't like to be treated like a princess, but that's just too bad. You are my princess. With love, Uzumaki Naruto, your warrior angel. The kid was good, a little too good, at a few things. Firstly, he could make her blush, four years later, without even being there. Every time she read the letter, it made her blush when he secretly promised to continue their sensual encounter. If anyone else had read the letter they wouldn't understand his meaning, or maybe they would, but it was worded vaguely enough that she could deny it, and she was grateful for that. Ao was always going through her things, and if he had seen a letter from someone as young as Naruto talked to her so casually about sex, He'd lecture her about the inappropriate age difference, which would lead her to believing he was calling her old, and then she would have to threaten his life, again. She'd rather not have to do that, because it happened all the time already, and she didn't want it to happen when she thought about her angel. She had a lot of suitors, and when she said a lot, she meant a lot. But none of them could make her blush like Naruto could. None of them could make her feel like Naruto made her feel. Secondly, he was able to make her feel like she was the most important woman in the world. The way he spoke, the way he wrote, he was able to speak to her heart and mind like no other was capable of. He had a troubled past, that much she was certain, and the fact that he wasn't a complete psychopath was a miracle. He had asked, specifically for her, to save a place for him to call his own. She was important enough for him to open up to her, and brave enough to ask for her heart, or at least a small part of it. They had only spent no longer than two weeks together, yet they already felt so close to one another. She hadn't realized how much she actually cared for him until he was gone for a while, but when she did, she hated it. To have these feelings for someone so young that a lot of people would look down on her for wasn't something she would call fun. To have these feelings for someone from another hidden village would cause people to question her ability to do whatever it took to protect her people, and that wasn't something she wanted to experience. But most of all, to have these feelings for someone who was always so far away from her hurt her every time she thought about him. Thirdly. If anyone else called her the princess, she'd melt their faces off with her Yotan. How he was able to actually have her enjoy being called his anything was no small feat. She was a very strong and independent woman, so things that made her sound weak or reliant were things she despised. When he said it though, it gave her this warm, dingly feeling in her stomach. It was absurd, but like everything else about Naruto, it was true. A knock on her door caused her to retreat from her mind. She quickly put the letter back into Naruto's bingo book entry page, and put them both back into her drawer. She took a deep breath to calm her emotions, reverting back to her Mizukage mindset, and said, Come in. Ao, who had taken the role of her assistant, walked through the doors, a stack of papers in his hands. She internally groaned, it looked like she'd never get out of her office. Mizukage-sama, the ex-hunter Nin began, Konoha has sent us a formal invitation to the upcoming Chunin exams, May's heart stopped, but her mind went into overdrive. She would be in Konoha. She would be in Konoha for a decent amount of time. She would be in Konoha with him. She briefly wondered if he was old enough now. 
May had an absolutely hungry smirk on her face. He did say the very next time. Week 1, Saru Tobi Asuma. Naruto's eyes were narrowed, his mind focused. He was in the most difficult battle of his life at this very moment. His opponent was better than him. He was trying, giving it his all, but he just couldn't get the upper hand. He was going to lose, he knew that now. He was giving off the feeling of victory. The fact that he had pushed his opponent this hard made it less bitter. This person had the mind of a god, and Naruto had kept up for this long. It was just too difficult, he didn't stand a chance. You lose, Naruto, said Blonde side in defeat. Damn, that was the most intense shogi match I've ever played. Narashikamaru said, falling backwards so that his back was on the patio. You're the greatest shogi player I've ever played against, besides my old man, Naruto laughed. Thanks. I never thought that you'd be so good. You have a serious knack for strategy. Naruto was currently at the Nara clan compound, having come home with Shikamaru after he observed Team 10 complete a mission. He had already been with them for a week now, and he had become incredibly close with the lazy Jinan. Shikamaru's intellect was second to none in his generation. Being able to talk to someone around his age that was able to keep up with him in a stimulating conversation was something that hadn't happened since Itachi left. If the kid wasn't so lazy, he'd say the friendship was perfect, but, like everything and everyone, nothing was perfect. He kind of guessed that it was for the better though, having someone who enjoyed just lying with you and watching the clouds float by was sometimes just what a person needed. And if Choji always brought snacks, Naruto could seriously get used to it. It was such a new and exciting experience to hang out with other kids, doing nothing but talking, and sometimes not even that. He loved hanging out with his Nei-chan, she was his best friend after all, but it was different when they were near his age, and boys. Sometimes you just couldn't talk about things with girls, and Naruto had plenty he wanted to say about the fairer sex. Unfortunately, none of the boys he'd met were into girls all that much yet, for one reason or another. Neji and Rock Lee were so obsessed with training they couldn't bother with the opposite gender. Choji just hadn't hit that point in his life, and Shikamaru thought that they were just too troublesome, and couldn't be bothered with the hassle. Guy and Asuma were out of the question, so that put him right back into his predicament. He had no one to talk to about his feeling towards women. Yuga would overreact and he'd end up in trouble for no apparent reason, so he was just out of luck. It's just a game. Shikamaru waved off. It doesn't account for stress and other variables that come with live combat. And it gets easier the more you play it. I kind of thought so, Naruto said. That was a fun first time though. He added, accepting a glass of tea Shikamaru handed him. The young Nara shook his head. You really are a monster, Naruto, he continued. If that was your first game, I don't want to see you when you actually know all of the rules, he chuckled. When he asked Naruto if he wanted to play, the blonde had asked for a 5 minute crash course on the game, and then gave him one of his hardest matches he'd ever played. The blonde was born with a mind equal to his, and that was scary if all of the rumors of his godlike power were true. The mind of a god, the power of a god, and the will of a god was the greatest triple threat the young Shinnan had ever heard of. Naruto actually smiled at being called a monster. And don't you forget it, he said playfully. When Asuma introduced him to Team 10, Shikamaru believed he was the bringer of hope right away. When asked why he was so accepting later on, he answered with, the way you walk and talk, the way you hold yourself, and the way your eyes are so aware of your surroundings was a dead giveaway. Naruto was impressed with his answer and had concluded that they were somewhat alike. Naruto could guess the intentions of an individual just by feeling them, and Shikamaru could guess an individual's intentions just by calculating it visually. He had found another monster, just a slightly different kind. Choji had believed him the moment Shikamaru did. It was apparent that his team thought highly of his powers of deduction, and trusted him to know what he was talking about. Choji was so gentle and kind that it made Naruto question if he was fit for the shinobi life or not. After spending a few days with him though, he realized that the boy was determined to protect his friends, and that deep down, a slumbering Cho was waiting to spread its wings. Ino was. Friendly. He wondered if all Yamanaka were so. Friendly. If she grew up to be anything like Risu, he'd have to have a serious talk with the clan head when he became Hokage. She was easy to be around though, and he could feel the real her. Underneath the obvious fangirl was someone who cared about her friends and family, and would protect them with her life if she needed to. And that was good enough for Naruto. Seriously though, man, you don't need to wait for my dad to get back, you are welcome to come in whenever you want to. The Narajanan said again, trying to convince his new friend. When they had arrived, Naruto had asked if Shikaku was home. When Shikamaru's mother, 
Yoshino, said that he was out with Inoiki and Choza, and wouldn't be home for at least another hour, he had asked if they could stay outside until he returned. Narushikaku was the Jonin commander, and an extremely respected shinobi. Naruto had only spoken to the man a handful of times, but he too was one of the people who respected him. If the man wasn't home, then he wouldn't enter until he returned. The greatest mind since the Lord Second Hokage deserved at least that. Shikamaru had thought it was stupid, but Naruto wouldn't budge. That's when they decided to play Shogi. It's important to me, Shikamaru. Naruto replied, Your father is a great man, and he deserves to be able to decide if he wants to allow me into his home or not. Naruto knew that Shikaku didn't see him as some comrade killing demon, but it was a sign of respect that he would give the Nara clan head. If he didn't want a monster in his house, then Naruto would honor his wishes. Whatever, Shikamaru sighed. He took a drink of his tea before he continued. What else do you want to do? He asked, looking at the sky above. Naruto smiled and turned to the street. It looks like we have company, he said, watching the blonde ponytail swing back and forth as it made its way to them. Even though Ino was prone to obsessive behavior, she was still a Konohanin, and Naruto wanted to get along with as many as his people as possible. Yamanaka Ino appeared at the front gate of Shikamaru's home. Oi, Shika. She called out behind the gate. Let me in. I'm bored, and Sasuke-kun won't talk to me. The mention of Uchiha Sasuke got Naruto's attention. Shikamaru sighed, but got up and let his blonde teammate in. When they walked to the patio, Ino was surprised to see Naruto sitting there, and Naruto-kun. What are you doing here? She asked somewhat shyly. The young Yamanaka had already added the kun suffix to his name, the girl already that comfortable with him after only one week. Naruto smiled at her. Shikamaru invited me over. He shrugged. I had nothing better to do, so I accepted. He really didn't either. After his time with Team Guy, and then the week with Team 10, he still was no closer to finding what his Sage Dust was missing, and it annoyed him something fierce. My Nechan is on a mission, and my Aniki is busy with his team, so I might as well hang out with you guys for a little while. He had taken up calling Kakashi Aniki in front of friends, the silver-haired man being the closest thing to an older brother he would ever have. Hayate had gotten closer to him during his three weeks of living in his apartment but it would kind of be strange to call his sister's lover his brother. So he just stayed Hayate. Oh, she said, okay then. What are you guys doing? I'm bored, she stated again. Naruto smirked. So, who's this, Sasuke-kun? He decided to pretend that he didn't know who the Uchiha was, so that he could start a fresh bond with Sasuke when they first met. Ino sighed dreamily. He's only the cutest boy in the whole world. Naruto finally understood why he had thought that she was a fangirl when they first met. He's so cool and mysterious, she continued, her eyes still shut, and one day, he's going to realize that I'm the one for him. Naruto could see Shikamaru shake his head from his cloud watching position. Then, forehead will know her place. She suddenly shouted, her eyes opening, only to narrow and squeezed her hand into a fist. Apparently forehead was another girl that ached for Sasuke's affection. Naruto was already proud of his future student, only just a Janan and already a lady killer. Well, good luck with that then, I guess, Naruto said. He was about to say something else until he noticed who was arriving. Naruto stood to his feet and walked over to the man he was waiting for. Narushikaku walked through the gate to his house, a lazy look on his face. When he saw the bringer of hope, Naruto wasn't surprised that all he received was a raised eyebrow. But he couldn't fool the blonde, even without his empathy. He could read the man just from his eyes. They were the eyes of a tactician, and they were calculating every possibility for the reason the Hokage's famed shadow was in his compound, hanging around his son and his friend's daughter. Naruto brought his head down slightly, the closest thing to a bow anyone but his god would receive from him. Shikaku-san, Shikamaru has invited me into your home. He began, Shikaku not showing the slightest of emotion, on the outside. Is it okay for me to be here? He asked never taking his eyes away from the Nara. Shikaku just stood there for a moment, not saying a word, and then put his hands in his pockets and walked forwards. Sure, why not, he said, acknowledging the other two present with a nod of his head before he entered his home through the main door. Naruto smiled, having felt Shikaku's message clearly. It wasn't a surprise that he knew the chakra burst code he and his GG used. The man was a genius after all, and something as simple as decoding a secret language was child's play for him. You're always welcome among the Nara. It would seem that Shikaku respected Naruto as much as Naruto respected him. When the Uzumaki rejoined the Yamanaka and young Nara, Ino giggled. 
You actually waited for Shikaku-san to get home? She asked, confused why he would do something like that. Naruto gave her a small smile. You'll get it sooner or later, he said cryptically, before following Shikamaru into his house, Ino following close behind. Week 2, Sarutobi Asuma. Naruto was walking home, a satisfied look on his face. He had just had a fantastic meal with Team 10, celebrating a wonderful two weeks together. When Naruto joined Team 10 to observe Asuma's teaching methods, he was a little hesitant at first. Asuma wasn't the biggest fan of his, so it was really anyone's guess how productive his two weeks with the man would be. Fortunately, Asuma knew how to look past his personal feelings and do the job he was assigned to do, like all shinobi should. It had been an awkward first couple of days, but after Naruto started to join the Jinan for the exercises, and even help out with their training, Asuma had made the blonde feel more comfortable. Like with Guy, Naruto had learned more than just teaching Jinan. He had spent two weeks with a genius, and had sharpened his mind because of it. He understood how the Nara Jinan looked at the world, and took what he could from it. He was already an intelligent person, and spending his years with Saru had made him a pretty good strategist, but Shikamaru was definitely in a league not many people could claim to be in. The speed of his thought processing was off the charts, faster than anyone the Uzumaki had ever met before. When he made a plan, there was never just one, but hundreds of them. He would have counter moves for counter moves, and was always prepared for anything. As for teaching Jinan, like he predicted, he learned a different way of doing it. With Guy, he learned that hard work and determination made greatness, and it did, but that wasn't the only way to achieve it. Asuma had taught him that sometimes, you needed to work to an individual's strengths. Not everyone learned the same way, and it was okay to give the people who needed it more attention, on occasion. He also learned that being a little gentle didn't mean that a person couldn't live as a shinobi. Choji was not a violent person, and didn't like to fight at all if he could help it, but after the little talk he had with the Akimichi, he knew he had what it took. Flashback Naruto had asked to speak with Choji alone after the training session they had that day. When Naruto brought him to the top of the Hokage Monument, Choji was a little confused. Um, Naruto-san. Choji started slowly. I don't think we're allowed up here. Naruto could feel the Akimichi's nervousness. Naruto was standing on the head of the Lord Fourth, his father, facing the village he protected with his life. It's fine, Choji. Naruto began. We won't get into any trouble, I promise. Naruto had the second highest clearance in the village. If anyone even tried to tell him to get down he'd laugh in their face. So what do you want to talk about? The Jinan asked, eating another chip from the bag in his hands. I wanted to tell you a story, Naruto said softly. Choji didn't understand, so Naruto elaborated. I want you to listen to this story, and then I want you to seriously think about what I've said afterwards. Choji still didn't understand, but nodded his head anyways. Sure, Naruto-san. Choji replied politely. Naruto began. This is the story of a monster. He took a deep breath. When he was still just a child, his people beat him. They scorned and shunned him for something he never did. He lived his life stuck in a nightmare, and no matter what he did, he couldn't wake up. He could feel Choji's heart. The Jinan really was too gentle. He lived like this for the first six years of his life, all alone, and stuck in his constant bad dream. Most would think that he would hate these people for what they did to him, but then most people would be wrong. It was quite the opposite actually, because the monster had one thing no one else had. Choji was very interested in this story. Empathy, the ability to feel the emotions of those around you, this monster had the gift of empathy. It's said that, once you completely understand someone, you can't help but love them, and this monster had fallen in love with the very people who hurt him, because he could feel their pain. They wept every time they saw him, and even though it wasn't his fault, they treated him like it was. So he decided to never resist them when they wanted to project their anger on him, because he knew that he was the only person who could take it. Naruto didn't know if the boy was going to tear up or not, but it looked like he would any moment now. It all changed though when he chose to become what everyone called him. Naruto gave the village a small smile. He chose to be a monster, to take another's life. This person was a foul, tainted demon, who was taking what did not belong to him. A little girl, with a heart as pure and gentle as yours, he was going to sentence this child to a life of servitude. He chose to save the innocent, and slay the demon. His smile darkened. With the demon's death, the monster had felt awake. He was free from his nightmare, and had finally understood what he was born to do. He finally turned his gaze from the view of the village to look right into Choji's eyes. The monster was born to protect heaven. 
he was charged by God to keep the shadows of hell from the light of heaven, and that meant that he had to kill even more. Naruto took in another deep breath. It's hard for those who can feel compassion even for their enemies to take a life. Now, Choji understood. But for the sake of peace, we shinobi have to sacrifice what we believe to be right or wrong, so that the civilians, the lifeblood of our home, can afford to keep the pureness of their hearts. Choji was seriously considering his words, and that was enough for Naruto. Choji, Naruto said softly, there is nothing wrong with being gentle or kind, he put his hand on the Akimichi's shoulder, but you need to know that this life is one full of bloodshed and loss. Choji feared that even the Kamikage was going to tell him that he couldn't make it as a ninja, like everyone else. Naruto smiled, not the small, or the dark one he'd already given him, but a bright, genuine one. And having someone like you by my side during these dark-filled times will be the best thing for our village. Choji's eyes widened. The bringer of hope had just, subtly, approved of his gentle nature. Why you mean it? He asked in shock. I never go back on my word, Choji. And you have my word, you will be a fine shinobi one day. The Janan did tear up here. No one but his father and mother had believed in him, not even his sensei thought he'd make it to Chunin. Asuma never said it out loud, but Choji could see it in his eyes, they looked like everyone else's. Choji just nodded, keeping his head down so that Naruto couldn't see his tears. It's okay to cry when you're happy. The Uzumaki suddenly said. It's when you cry out of fear when you become incompetent. He pushed the Janan's head up. Keep your head up high, Choji. You're a Konoha Shinobi now, be proud of it. Choji kept his head towards the sky, vowing to never lower it again. Naruto smiled and nodded his head. He had started the process, now it was up to the Cho to spread its wings. Naruto started to walk towards the edge of the monument, but before he could do anything, Choji stopped to ask him one last question. Wait, Naruto. The blonde looked at him from over his shoulder. Yeah? The monster, in your story. Who is it? The wild look Naruto gave him caused the Akimichi to gulp. Yours truly, Naruto said before jumping off the giant cliff. Choji's eyes widened both at the statement, and at the jump. When he finally gathered enough of his rational thoughts, he sprung to the edge, looking for the legendary shinobi. When he peered over, there wasn't a sign of the Kamikage at all, like he hadn't been there in the first place. Naruto had shunshined, body flickered, to the trees behind the Janan to see what his reaction would be. When all he saw was burning determination, he smirked. Konoha had just gained a soon-to-be powerful Akimichi. And Naruto had gained another bond. And flashback every time he remembered the look in Choji's eyes, he couldn't help but smile. It always made him feel good to help a comrade wake from their slumber. During his recap of his talk with the Janan, Naruto had made it to his apartment, right on time to see Yogao and Hayate walk in, giving off the emotions of strong sexual desires. The blonde chuckled, and when the door closed behind the horny couple, Naruto made his way for the roof, giving the lovers their alone time. Most brothers would find it gross that their sister was about to have intercourse, but it only made Naruto happy. Not in a creepy, perverted way, it just reminded him that they loved each other, and that she could still be with her loved one. Many people had lost or, like in Naruto's case, couldn't be with the person they wanted to be with, and the fact that Yugao and Hayate could still hold each other, could still express their love for each other, made him want to protect their bond even more. When they made love, Naruto could feel the strength of their bond, and it never ceased to amaze him how strong it was. They were truly soulmates, meant to be with each other for all eternity, in this life, and the next. True love. The roof wasn't comfortable, but he was used to lying on cold, hard surfaces, so it didn't bother him too much. He was on his back, his head resting in his arms that were above him, and he just watched the clouds, enjoying Shikamaru's hobby. It was late afternoon, and Naruto knew that he'd be up on the roof for a while, so when sleep tugged at his mind, he didn't resist it. A nap sounded perfect. Naruto's eyes opened before she even made the jump up to the roof where he was napping. The sky was dark and the air was cooler than when it was before he closed his eyes. When Yuga landed next to him, he sat up, rubbing the soreness from his neck. Thank you. She said, calmly. Naruto understood what she meant. For waiting for us to finish. Most people would at least be a little embarrassed in her situation, but after spending years together, she got used to her Atoto knowing everything that went down around her, even when she had sex with her boyfriend, and understood that it wasn't like he was peeping on them or anything. Her brother was a very mature person, and sex became a popular subject between the two, 
either Yu Gao explaining that just because it was legal for him to have it didn't mean that he should, or her thanking him for allowing her to have it with Hayate even when they were on the job and covering for her. It didn't happen all the time, but when it did, she was extremely grateful. Um? Naruto hummed his response. It wasn't a big deal for either of them. Are you hungry? Hayate's making dinner. The special Jonin was an amazing cook, and because of that, made most of the meals they ate. Yeah. Naruto responded again. Yugao looked at him with worry in her eyes. Is something wrong? She asked, never liking it when he wasn't his usual self. No, nothing's wrong, Naruto whispered as he made his way to the apartment. Just a bad dream, is all. He finished as jumped off the roof. Yugao sighed. Bad dream, i.e. a dream about Terumi Mei. Whenever Naruto dreamt about the Mizukage, it was never a good thing, because it reminded him that they were always so far apart. They were from different countries, different worlds, and so far apart in age. It saddened him that fate had made it as hard for them as it could. Even so, the woman wouldn't leave his thoughts in peace. Yugao dropped from the roof as well, and entered her shared home. She had at first disapproved of the relationship between the two, but now, after such a long time, he still felt for the woman. That had to mean something. That had to mean that he actually cared for her. She just wondered if the woman still cared for him. As Naruto found a seat at the dinner table, he couldn't help but remember his promise to his first love. Anko was upset. The Kunoichi was uncharacteristically frustrated. Having someone out there who could make her feel like a shy academy girl was getting on her nerves. That person being nine years her junior made it all the more irritating. After the duel four weeks ago, the blonde was a constant in her mind. The snake mistress had, like most of the village, been one of his fans while he was still a secret operative in the Anbu. She was never an extreme fangirl of his, but she could appreciate the nation's greatest shinobi to a certain degree. After her first encounter with the boy however, the Kamikage had become more of a personal savior than a world-renowned hero. The removal of her curse mark had meant more to her than she honestly thought it would. She, of course, knew that she would be extremely grateful to the person if it ever happened, but when it went from dream to reality, when it actually happened, she wanted to do anything and everything she could to properly thank him. Then, somehow, he had heard her innermost desire. Her heart was screaming out to be saved, for a knight in shining armor to rush in and rescue her from her burden. The sickening reminder of her traitorous sensei caused her stomach to curl every single day from the second she woke until she fell asleep. For that to be gone meant the world to her, and all she could do was make a fool out of herself when she tried to thank him. She had no idea how she was going to thank him properly. It was incredibly hard to find something for someone like him, and she was not going to offer him her body. He was definitely cute, and she was attracted to him, but she didn't want him to think she was a slutty whore like a lot of the village did. He was someone important to her, and she didn't want him to look at her with disgusted eyes. That left her right back to square one. How the hell was she supposed to properly thank him? During her little inner crisis, a certain purple-haired woman walked into the very same dango shop that she was at with a certain blonde companion. Anko wasn't paying all that much attention, so when Yugao and Naruto walked up to her table and sat down, she didn't even notice. Naruto smiled at the woman's focus. Yugao was a bit annoyed. Her cough was a little overdramatic. Ahem. It's rude to ignore your peers, Anko-chan. The Kunoichi scolded her friend. When Anko made eye contact with Naruto she immediately choked on the dango in her mouth. After a minute of intense coughing, the snake mistress was very red from embarrassment. W what are you guys doing here? She asked a little angrily. Naruto wanted to speak with you, and wherever there's Dango, you're always nearby, Anko chuckled at the Dango remark but stayed silent. The bringer of hope wanted to speak with her? She definitely didn't want to make a fool out of herself in front of him. What did you want to talk about, soldier boy? She asked playfully, trying to hide her nervousness. She couldn't hide anything from him though, no one could. He smiled like he was none the wiser though. Um, it's kind of private, so how about you and I take a walk, and Nei-chan? You wait here. When we're done, we'll come back and have some dango. Yu Gao narrowed her eyes for a moment before relenting with a sigh. All right, just hurry back. She looked accusingly at Anko. And Maya Toto better come back a virgin. Anko gulped and Naruto sighed. He had no intention of having a quickie with Anko. At this rate he'd be a virgin at 30. Yeah, yeah, whatever, Naruto said lazily. We'll be back soon. And with that, Naruto let Anko out of the dango shop. Sorry, Yu Gao is a little overprotective with me. She thinks every female in the world is out to steal my virginity. The blonde explained while they walked side by side. 
Anko rubbed the back of her neck sheepishly. Ah, it's fine, she said a little awkwardly. She's just trying to look out, for you. She then gave a confused look. Um, where are we going by the way? Naruto smiled. Well, I could take you to my room, since I've seen yours, but if it's okay with you I'd like to show you my favorite place in the village. The Uzumaki felt the woman's embarrassment, but held back his laughter. Sure, Anko said softly, her eyes looking everywhere but at him. Naruto just nodded to himself and continued walking. Six minutes later and they were on top of the Hokage Tower. The view was beautiful, the giant Hokage monument right behind them, acting like guardians, watching over their precious home. I have something I need to tell you. Naruto suddenly spoke out, causing Anko to look at him. It's been bothering me for a long time now, he sighed, and ran his right hand through his blonde hair. I was born with this ability called empathy. He began. With it, I'm able to feel the emotions of those around me to an extreme degree. Anko flushed a deep crimson. Great, now he could feel her emotions? She wanted to speak up and ask him multiple questions, but the apprehensive look on his face made her hold her tongue, for now. When I removed your curse mark. Here he even looked away, like he was ashamed of what he had done. I had to. Sink with you. Anko didn't understand, so he explained. I needed to feel the foreign chakra and substances within your body. To do that, I needed to push my own chakra into your chakra circulatory system. He rubbed the back of his head awkwardly. When I do that, my empathic abilities are at their highest, he sighed. My mind became in sync with yours, and because of that, I saw your soul. You. You saw my soul? What does that even mean? Anko asked, unsure how to even begin to feel about that. Naruto looked her straight in the eyes. It means I've felt everything you've ever felt. I've seen everything you've ever seen. I've heard and smelled everything you've ever heard and smelled. I momentarily was you, your everything was transferred to me. He gave her a sad look. I invaded your most private thoughts, your deepest secrets and fears were given to me without your approval. I, I stole from you. He shook his head. I've killed men for taking what didn't belong to them before. I tried to tell myself that it was for your sake, that I helped you overcome what, here he saw Anko tense, he did to you, but that excuse just doesn't work for me anymore. After Naruto, Yugao and Hayate ate dinner last night, he couldn't sleep. He had no desire to dream about Mei again, and that left him with his thoughts. For Shinobi, your own head could be a scary place. During his inner rambling, he had come upon something that had been bothering him for a long time, Anko. The woman was so misunderstood, and like certain beings he knew, Naruto wanted to help her. Knowing someone the way he knew Anko obviously made her someone he felt close to. He had seen everything, her happiness, her pain and suffering, everything. How couldn't he feel close to her after that? He always said that once you understood someone completely, you can't help but love them, and because of that one encounter, Naruto had come to love Anko. He understood her probably better than she understood herself, and now that he had her memories, he couldn't help but feel guilty for taking the one thing that no one, not even he, could touch her thoughts. When Anko stayed silent, he continued. That's why I brought you here, he said softly. I thought you deserved to know something about me that only four other people in the whole village, the whole world, know. Anko finally lifted her head, and Naruto smiled. This is where my father proposed to my mother. Anko's face contorted into confusion. She had thought that the Kyuubi Jinchuriki was an orphan who didn't know his parents. My parentage is an s rank secret, but since I have all of your secrets, you deserve to have some of mine. He turned his gaze to the Hokage monument. My father was Namikaze Minato, our Lord Fourth Hokage. Anko's eyes widened. She was sure she had heard the greatest secret Konoha had at the moment. My mother was Uzumaki Kushina, and she was the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki before me. The Kunoichi wasn't sure if she was allowed to hear all of this information or not, but she was sure as hell not going to ask him to stop. I know that this won't make up for what I've done. But I just wanted you to at least have something of mine, too. Anko swallowed hard, trying to make sure her voice wouldn't shake when she spoke. I. She took a deep breath to calm herself. I'm not angry with you, she whispered, shocking Naruto. Even if you did take my thoughts with you, she looked him straight in the eye, you removed the curse mark from me. I'd gladly give you anything for that. Naruto could feel Anko's heart, and he hated himself even more now, but for a different reason. He felt like he was betraying Mei because he was positively, without a doubt, falling for the snake mistress. He decided to think about his love interests later and deal with what was right in front of him. With his empathy, he could already tell that she wanted, needed, 
a way to express her sincere gratitude to him and couldn't find a right way how. He decided to put her mind at ease. Can I tell you something else kind of personal, Anko? He asked innocently. Anka nodded. Okay. You already know that I'm the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki, and you now know that the man who sealed him within me was my own father. Anko gave him a sad look. That night, the Kyuubi killed both my parents. I was orphaned not 30 minutes after I was born. He could feel Anko's sad mind. You've probably read my bingo book entry. Anka nodded. So you know I have full control over the Baijuo. What you don't know, and only four others do, is that I don't force the Kyuubi to help me. Anko was confused. Everyone thinks that Ichiha Itachi was my first friend. That little piece of information was news to the Kunoichi, shocking news, but she didn't voice it. But he wasn't, he continued. The Kyuubi no Kitsune was my very first friend. Anko stopped breathing for a few seconds. Did she hear him right? Naruto chuckled at her surprise. People believe the Baijuu to be mindless demons that only crave death and destruction, but they aren't. They're just misunderstood entities, and they're mistreated because they're different. With my empathic abilities, I was able to understand the Kyuubi. He smiled. I don't stand against, or even above the Baijuu, Anko. I stand beside them. Anko was more than a little shocked at what the boy was saying. Anyways, back to my point. He quickly said. My first friend, the Kyuubi, killed my parents. I was orphaned because of him. I was beaten and shunned by the village because of him. And you wanna know something, his smile grew even bigger, he's never apologized, not even once. Anko looked at him incredulously. Why would he smile at something like that? Naruto walked up to Anko, just close enough to outstretch his hand and place it over Anko's heart. Do you know why he's never apologized to me? Why he's never asked for forgiveness for me for practically ruining my life? Anko didn't nod, but Naruto continued anyways. He gave her a small, genuine smile. Because with me, his eyes met hers, words are not needed. Her brown eyes widened, finally understanding where he was going. He must have felt her conflicted mind. He knew she wanted to explain to him how she felt, and he took it upon himself to ease her mind. That was all she could take. It was over, she couldn't deny it anymore. She was in love with him. Anko smiled the most genuine, happy smile she'd given anyone since her sensei before she bent down and placed a soft kiss on the blonde's lips. Naruto kind of saw it coming, his empathy and all, so he was able to kiss her back before it ended. When it did, Anko sighed. You're amazing, you know that? She said, shaking her head. How a 15-year-old had managed to interest her so much was a feat she thought impossible. So I've been told. He replied with a smirk. Oh? And cheeky, too. She added before she took in a deep breath of the cool afternoon air. We should get back before you gal thinks I've raped you or something. Naruto sighed with a small chuckle. Yeah, he said while making for the stairs. Yeah, we should. Neither of them knew where their feelings were going to take them, but they decided to just see what fate had in store for them. They didn't know if they would even have a relationship beyond friends, but if that's what ended up happening, they'd be okay with it, because they would at least be there for each other. Naruto had made another bond, this one stronger than the others, and if he were honest, much more complicated. What was he doing? What about Mei? That's when it hit him with all the gentleness of a sledgehammer, what if Mei had moved on and forgotten about him? His emotional struggles angered him. They reminded him of his mortality. They reminded him that he wasn't invincible. Seriously? Naruto asked a little excitedly. Right now? He asked again, a smile on his face the entire time. Yeah. Yugao replied as she walked beside her brother towards the Inuzuka compound. Hayate-kun said it was alright with him, so unless you don't want one. She drawled out, waiting for his response. No, he shouted quickly. Of course I want one. His reaction got a smile from Yugao. Whenever she got her Atoto to act his age she felt like she completed an S-rank mission. Good. Yugao nodded, a triumphant smirk across her face. I mean, who doesn't like puppies? The two were headed to the Inuzuka compound to pick out a dog for the apartment. Considering that they were all battle-hardened shinobi, two of which were Anbu, they quickly decided that a Ninkan would be the best choice. The only place in the whole village to find a Ninkan was with the Inuzuka, and since Yugao was such good friends with Hana, they could pick from the cream of the crop. Yugao had thought that a puppy would take Naruto's mind off Mei, since the Mizukage was obviously on it. After talking it over with Hayate, they decided that they could handle a puppy, if they all shared the responsibilities. Obviously, Hayate was going to be taking care of it the most, 
What with Yu Gao being an Anbu captain and Naruto being, well, the bringer of hope, they were the two that were out of the village the most. The blonde could feel his sister's mind and knew that she was trying to get him to stop thinking about Mei. The only problem was that he wasn't just thinking about the auburn-haired beauty. After his talk with Anko, he had been so unsure of himself. He no longer knew what he really wanted. He loved both of them, equally. With Mei, he had been accepted by a complete stranger. She was the very first woman Naruto had any interest in, and after the nights of sleeping in the same bed together, and her giving him his first kiss, and then the second, and third, and fourth, and so on, he had developed genuine feelings for her. She understood him, and didn't fear his power, but thought it was attractive. Then with Anko, he had completely understood the woman. He had seen her entire life laid out in front of him. It was like he had known her his entire life, like he was with her during all of her experiences. He had never been so close to someone in his whole life. He knew what her soul looked like, and he was captivated by it. So here he was, torn between two women. Again, he was forced to realize his humanity. He was forced to realize that the monster couldn't fix every problem. It infuriated him beyond belief. On the bright side he was getting a puppy. Here we are. Yu Gao suddenly said, snapping Naruto out of his thoughts. Now, she said happily, let's go get us a pup. Naruto gave her his best, attempted a happy smile, trying to convince her that nothing was bothering him. The two walked in the compound, many of the people greeting Yugao. The purple-haired Kunoichi had been to the compound many times, and the Inuzuka were friendly towards people they knew. They were a very pack-like people, and Yugao was a known friend of their clan head's daughter, making her part of the Chunin's pack. A short walk later had Naruto and Yugao standing in front of the Inuzuka Animal Clinic. It was a fairly small building, just enough to fit everything that was required of veterinarians. Dark gray in color, it had a very professional feel to it. With one last glance, the brother-sister duo made their way into Hana's workplace. The moment they entered, the Inuzuka pounced on them, like she was waiting for them at the door the whole time. Finally, the Inuzuka heiress shouted, her calm and collected look gone, replaced with a brash and playful one. It seemed like whenever she was in the presence of a close friend she became a completely different person. It was like she was awake when one of them was around. That thought made Naruto sigh. He hadn't been awake in such a long time. I was wondering if you'd ever show up. Yu Gao smiled, patting the woman's head, receiving a grateful hum in return. Sorry, Hanachan. The Anbu woman said. We stopped to speak with Anko. Naruto-kun needed to discuss something with her. Hana suddenly seemed very embarrassed. Naruto chuckled. She only noticed he was there when Yu Gao mentioned him. Most people paid so much attention to him it felt like he was royalty and not just a shinobi. Being ignored was refreshing. Hello, Hana-san, it's nice to finally meet you, Naruto said. Last time, he paused, bringing his hand to his neck, I didn't get the chance to properly meet you. Hana was silent for all but four seconds before she became her bubbly self again. Yes, nice to meet you, too. Anko tried to hug you all to herself last time. She offered her hand to Naruto. Inuzu Kahana, and you, my cute blonde friend, are the bringer of hope. Naruto smiled and shook the offered hand. Usually he was a little put off when people called him cute. It more than likely meant that a girl liked him or someone was making a crack at his age. It seemed like neither was the case with Hana. She was just being friendly, and Naruto found himself appreciating the woman's attitude. Yeah, sorry about that. He began. There was a much needed conversation to have a Naiko. Well, you know. He smirked. She's not the most patient of people, Hana laughed and Yu Gao snorted. You don't even know the half of it, cutie, Naruto chuckled, both at the apparent nickname he had acquired from the woman, and at the fact that he knew exactly how impatient Anko could be. He knew the woman better than anyone else. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you have a couple of puppies we can look at? Yu Gao said. Naruto laughed a little at that. He didn't know who was more excited about getting a dog, him, or his Nei Chan. Ah? Uh, Yes, Hana said cheerily. Follow me, they're in the back. Yu Gao nodded, walking next to Hana and speaking about something that involved a fight with Hana and her mother, but Naruto paid little attention to the conversation. As he walked slowly behind the two Kunoichi, he couldn't help but have this bad feeling, like someone he was close to was in trouble. He sighed, it was times like these that he wished his empathy didn't have such a short range of effect. If he could feel the entire world, he wouldn't have to worry if someone he considered precious to him was in danger. Deciding that there was nothing he could do at the moment, he put his attention on picking out one of the six puppies he was now in front of. Ah, 
They're all so cute, Yu Gao cried in a momentarily uncharacteristic girlish way. The Yanbu captain was by no means manly, or even unfeminine, she just barely showed her girly side. Apparently, puppies were her weakness. But you get to choose, Naruto-kun. She finished with a small, happy smile on her face. Naruto gave each puppy a glance, trying to find the one with that certain look in its eye, the look of intelligence. Puppies 1 and 2 were out of the picture. They looked so dull that Naruto wanted to ask if they were slow in the head. He quickly reconsidered, deciding that both Hana and Yu Ga would give him that special evil-eyed look that only females could give. Puppies 3 and 4 were a little better, but they just weren't what he was looking for. The fifth puppy looked like he was Inara, the way he was sprawled out on his back, just staring at the ceiling. It actually made Naruto chuckle, he'd have to tell Shikamaru that he had a twin, and that twin was a pup. That's when he saw her. The sixth puppy was definitely the one that Naruto wanted. The look in her eye told him everything he needed to know. The puppet spirit and an intelligent look in her eye, a look that screamed awareness. If he was going to trust a dog to protect his home it was going to be one that knew what it was doing. The last one on the right, he said. I want that one. His smile faded when he felt Hana's mind. Ah, I don't think that's a good idea. Hana replied. She's somewhat of a wild one. She doesn't listen to anyone, not even the alphas. The Inuzuka sighed. She hasn't even accepted a name. She shook her head. You should pick a more obedient pup. Naruto thought it over for a second before he asked, Do you know why she's so disobedient? Hana sighed again. Her mother made it with a wild wolf. She began to explain. Wolves are harder to train, especially if they're wild. I don't know if the pup will ever find a master. Naruto smirked. May I try something? He asked. There was nothing the Kamikage couldn't do. Um, sure, just don't be too disappointed if nothing changes. Yu Gao gave a short laugh and Hana turned to her. What? She asked, a little confused. You've never met an alpha like Naruto before, Hana. She explained. He's an alpha among alphas. That puppy will obey Naruto, just like everyone else. Hana highly doubted that. The boy might be the most powerful shinobi in Konoha, but he was overestimating himself. He knew nothing of the minds of dogs, and he would soon understand that. Naruto walked right up to the puppy that he had chosen, and bent down to look it in the eyes. She was on a table, so he didn't have to bend down far. The half-breed had beautiful white fur, and her eyes were a mix of green and yellow. The pup started to growl as Naruto's face got closer, and Hana was seriously worried that she'd claw at it. Hello! He greeted her, earning a lower growl. She began to bare her fangs at him, and he chuckled. You're a wild one, aren't you? The dog snarled, crouching low like she was about to attack. That's when the blonde's eyes turned gold, his body flooding with natural energy. The second his eyes changed, the puppy began to whimper, already feeling the purity of the world's power within the human. Naruto smiled. I'm your master now, okay, he stated, picking the pup up. When she just let him pick her up, he scratched her head lightly. Good girl, he said happily. Hana didn't quite believe what she was seeing. Are you serious? She yelled a little indignantly. That mutt hasn't let anyone, not even my mother, even get near her, and you say a few words and she's all of a sudden obedient? Yu Gao chuckled. I told you, Hana. There isn't a thing in this world my cute little brother can do. Naruto rolled his eyes at the cute remark, his sister was always giving him a hard time. What are you going to name her, Naruto-kun? She asked. When he picked her up, he heard the little bell around her neck ring, which gave him an idea. Suzu? He suddenly said. Her name is Suzu. He looked down at his new puppy to see if she liked the name. When she gave a happy bark he smiled. Bell, huh? Yu Gao said in concentration. Not very original, but appropriate. She nodded her head. I like it. Suzu it is. They both smiled at each other. She accepted the first name you gave her, too? What the hell are you? Apparently Hana was still incredibly confused. Naruto just smiled. It's an animalistic thing. He pet Suzu on the head again. So, how much do we owe you? Hana just shook her head in exasperation. Yuga wasn't kidding when she meant he was capable of anything. What are they doing in Nami no Kuni? Naruto asked the Lord Third. After he took Suzu home and introduced her to Hayate, he had spent the rest of the day with Yugao, just talking about whatever came up. Naruto explained how he was getting along with all of the Janan and Jonin he was assigned to, and how he enjoyed making bonds with people nearer his age. Yugao now knew who every Janan he had bonded with was, and a description of each of their personalities. Yugao had smiled the whole time, 
loving the fact that her brother was making new friends. Then Hayate had made dinner, and the three of them ate together, like a family. Naruto loved their family time. A restless night's sleep with dreams not only of Mei, but Anko as well, had Naruto a little tired, and incredibly embarrassed. Some of his dreams were not the kind you could speak out loud about, and some of them had both Anko and Mei in them at the same time. Now he was in the Hokage's office, trying to figure out where his next assignment was. Apparently, they were in Nami no Kuni. I gave them their very first C-rank mission, Hiruzen said. They were all very eager to take on higher rank tasks. Naruto nodded in understanding. He had watched Team Ten do plenty of D-rank missions to know that they were not fun. All right, he sighed, I guess I'll make my way there now, then. He made for the door but was stopped by his commander. Wait, Naruto-kun. Hiruzen held up his hand. There's something I'd like you to handle for me while you're there. Haruno Sakura was having a rough day. It started out fantastic. Team 7 was finally given a C-rank mission after she and her crush Uchiha Sasuke pleaded for one. She and her teammates were ecstatic to finally be rid of the annoyingly boring D-ranks, and had started their first C-rank with high hopes. Not an hour in their little trip to the Land of Waves and they were attacked by two crazy carry missing men. When their sensei, Hitake Kakashi had seemingly been torn to shreds, literally, Sakura had thought she was going to die. Oh, she protected the client, an old drunk of a bridge builder named Tazuna, with her body, but she was still horrified that she was going to be killed. When Sasuke and their other teammate, a strange and incredibly rude, pale boy named Sai, had taken the two head on, she was surprised. They both looked so cool. She might not like Sai at all, what with him calling her ugly all the time, but inner Sakura thought he was cute. She was so relieved when Kakashi Sensei had rushed out of nowhere and apprehended the two Chunin rank shinobi. She wanted to yell at her Sensei for almost giving her a heart attack, but when he complimented all of them for what they did, even her, she decided to keep her mouth shut. After arriving in Nami no Kuni, they were again attacked, this time by a powerful Jonin Kiri missing Nin. Momochi Zabuza was apparently the Kirigakur no Kijin, demon of the hidden mist, and one of the seven swordsmen of Kirigakur. The man had almost cut them down by throwing his sword at them. Luckily, Kakashi Sensei had noticed it in time, or she wouldn't still be breathing. Their Sensei had revealed that he had the Sharingan, the Dojutsu of Sasuke-kun's clan, and used it to fight the missing Nin. After a brief but no less intense death match, Kakashi Sensei had been trapped in Zabuza's Suro no Jutsu, water prison technique. Sakura was again terrified, but like with Yoni, Kyodai, Demon Brothers, she had stood her ground and protected the client. After ignoring Kakashi Sensei's order to retreat, Sasuke and Sai managed to free him with clever usage of Sai's Choju Giga, Super Beast imitation drawing, and Sasuke's Demon Wind Shuriken. Once free, Kakashi Sensei did something with his Sharingan where he predicted everything Zabuza did, and then used it against him. A couple of Sutan Jutsu later and Kakashi was about to deliver the blow that would end the man's life, but he was beat to it by Akiri Hunter Nin. After Kakashi had explained what a Hunter Nin was, he had collapsed. Sakura feared for his life, but was relieved when he told them that it was only exhaustion. They carried their incapacitated sensei to Tazuna's house, where his daughter and grandson also lived. His daughter, Tsunami, was a beautiful, dark-haired woman who was incredibly polite. When they arrived she had tried to help all that she could with comforting their sensei. After 30 minutes, Kakashi sensei was situated in one of the rooms on the second floor. Sasuke, Sai and herself had taken it upon themselves to explain the situation they were in and offered to help out as much as they could for housing them. That's how she ended up here, helping Tsunami prepare dinner, while Sasuke-kun and Sai sat at the dinner table, waiting to be useful. Dazuna was drinking as usual on the other side of the Konohajin Nan, and Tsunami's son, Inari, was in his room still. They hadn't met the boy yet. Apparently, he was reclusive. Thank you for the help, Sakura-san. I really appreciate it. Tsunami thanked the pink-haired girl. It's nice having another girl around. She smiled. Living with two boys is so tiring at times. Before Sakura could reply, Tazuna shouted, I'm no boy. I'm a man. His words were slurred and that made Sakura and Tsunami laugh all the more. Even Sasuke-kun smirked, and Sai. Well Sai gave his creepy fake smile. As I was saying, Tsunami continued, ignoring her father's claims of manhood. It's wonderful having you here, even under such, she paused and looked at her father with worried eyes, troubling times. Sakura shook her head. No need to thank me, Tsunami-san. She gave the woman a bright smile. I don't mind at all. 
I actually enjoy cooking, so it's not a bother. She could see the gratefulness in the woman's eyes. She was thankful for them. Most shinobi would have turned back when they realized that the mission was beyond what they were paid to do. For them to decide to overlook her father's deception and help anyways meant the world to her. Even if you don't mind, I'm still very thankful. Tsunami really wanted to make sure they understood her gratitude. Sakura smiled and opened her mouth as if to say something but was cut off by a knock at the door. The three shinobi tensed, thinking that it might be another attack. So soon? Sakura thought. They faced Zabuza barely an hour ago. Another attack so soon was a little unexpected. Sai stood and took out his scroll and paint brush, ready to protect Tazna. Sakura brought up a kunai, deciding to stay by Tsunami and protect her. Sasuke also took out a kunai and made his way to the door. When someone knocked again, Sasuke slowly opened it and paused. Sakura had thought that it was out of fear, but when she saw his confused face she let herself calm, but only slightly. Who are you? Sasuke asked bluntly. He had a frown on his face, an obvious indication that he was upset for being bothered. Jonin Uzumaki Naruto, here to observe Jonin Hatake Kakashi. A voice called out, causing Sakura to calm even more. May I come in? I haven't seen Kakashi Senpai in a couple of weeks. The voice was polite and cheery, obviously a friendly. When Sakura saw Sai put his scroll and brush away, she sighed and put her kunai back in her weapons pouch. A blonde boy a few years older than the rest of them in a black shirt, his entire right sleeve a burnt orange, a Konoha black jacket and black pants walked in, his hands in his pockets and a small smile on his face. So they sent a slightly older run to help out. Tazuna slurred. Wonderful. I feel safer already. He deadpanned. After he spoke, he took a giant gulp of his alcohol. Naruto just smiled at the man. It's nice to meet you all. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, a Jonin from Kanahaga Kaur. He then looked up at the roof. So Senpai's injured? What happened? He directed his question at Sasuke. Kakashi became exhausted when he fought Momochi Zabuza. He's fine, he's just low on chakra. Sasuke answered stoically. He's resting upstairs for now. He should be back to normal in a few days. Naruto smirked and waved his hand in front of him. Ma, ma. He made his way for the stairs. I'll get him up and going right now. Sasuke raised an eyebrow and followed the blonde, wanting to see what he'd do. Chakra exhaustion was a serious thing, and even skilled medical nin couldn't help it. Sakura also followed, she, too, curious about the blonde's claim. Sai seemed not to care all that much and decided to stay downstairs. When the three young shinobi made it to the room Kakashi was in, Naruto immediately smiled. Oi, Kakashi-ni, get up already, he said happily as he kneeled down and placed a hand on the silver-haired man's chest. Sasuke and Sakura couldn't see it, but Naruto had flooded Kakashi's system with his own chakra, energizing him completely. Kakashi's only visible eye shot open, and he quickly sat up, already feeling the effects of having such potent chakra in his body. He felt better than ever, like he just had the greatest sleep in his life. When he saw Naruto kneeling beside him with a bright smile on his face, he gave the Uzumaki one of his trademark eye smiles. Ah, Naruto-kun. He began. It's good to see you. It's been a couple of weeks, Atoto. He put his hand on the blonde's shoulder, expressing his gratefulness at receiving his chakra. I know. We've both been so busy lately. He, perked up a little. Oh, you gonna let me get a puppy. He cheered. Her name's Suzu, she's as cool as Pakun, I swear. Kakashi kept his eye smile the whole time, nodding at the boy's words. I don't know about that, Naruto-kun. Pakun is pretty cool. Kakashi replied. Naruto shook his head. Honest. You have to meet her. She's half a wolf, and her eyes are really pretty. Kakashi chuckled, and then stood to his feet. I most definitely want to meet this Suzu. I need to see if she is as amazing as you say she is. He then noticed his Janan's strange looks. Ah, that's right. He turned to Naruto again. Naruto, these are two of my cute little students, Haruno Sakura and Uchiha Sasuke. He knew Naruto knew who Sasuke was, but decided to play along with Naruto's wishes to act like he didn't for the time being. Guys, this is my little brother, Usamaki Naruto. He's been a Jonin for. He paused for a second, bringing his hand to his chin in a thinking pose. Four weeks now, I think. He looked at Naruto for confirmation. When the blonde nodded, he continued. Yeah, four weeks now. He saw that their faces still looked confused. What is it? How are you better, Sensei? I thought you'd be out for at least a day or two, Sakura said what was on both Shinan's minds. Ah, uh, that. 
The scarecrow said lazily. Naruto-kun here can transfer chakra. He just gave me some of his just now. That was a bit of an understatement. Naruto had flooded his system with two times more than he had before he left Konoha. If he gave him any more it would have burst his tenkatsu. I've never heard of someone being able to do that before. Sasuke muttered. Naruto gave the Uchiha a smile. I'm a little special, Sasuke-san. I can do a lot of things you've never heard of before, Naruto said as he moved to stand by Kakashi. You don't look all that special to me. Sasuke retorted, not even bothering to look the blonde in the face. You only just became a Jonin, don't let it go to your head, Naruto chuckled a little at that one. Ma, you shouldn't speak about things you don't know, Sasuke. Kakashi suddenly said. Naruto-kun might have just become a Jonin, but that doesn't mean he isn't special. Mayatoto joined the ranks of Jonin after just recently leaving the Anbu. Both Sasuke and Sakura's eyes widened. He was with the Black Ops for eight years, and has accomplished more than even I have. He gave another eye smile. You're in the presence of the Kamikage. His eye smile then turned into a smirk. Show a little respect. At their shocked expressions and minds, Naruto smiled and shook his head. It's fine, Senpai. He held his hand in front of the two. I'd like it if we could just be friends, if that's okay with you. Sakura broke out of her shock-induced stupor and grabbed the blonde's hand. Yeah, nice to meet you, too, she said excitedly. I'll gladly be your friend. Naruto smiled at the girl's attitude. And her larger-than-average forehead strengthened his deduction that this was Ino's rival. The way her emotions were towards the Uchiha made it clear. HN. Was all Sasuke said, but Naruto knew his answer. The raven-haired boy was glad to have met him. Um, sensei. She turned to Naruto. No offense, Naruto-san. She then turned back to Kakashi. But why is he here? She asked, very curious as to why someone so incredibly famous came to their rescue and they hadn't even asked for help. Naruto had thought that Team 7 would know about his assignment by now, but apparently none of the teams conversed. Kakashi started to walk out of the room while he answered. Naruto Kohai has been assigned a special teaching mission. He has to observe some of the Jonin with Shinan teams so that he can take on his own squad one day. He's already been attached to two others. He turned to Naruto. That reminds me, how was your time with Guy and Asuma? Naruto smiled at his captain. It was educational, but most of all, fun, he chuckled. Guy is a real piece of work. Kakashi nodded in understanding. That he is, he said before reaching the bottom of the stairs. And Asuma? He asked, wanting to know how the Sarutobi treated his brother. Naruto smiled again. It took him a couple of days, but he warmed up to me quick enough. Good. Kakashi replied softly. He really didn't want to lose a friend because said friend treated his kohai badly. When they reached the kitchen, Tsunami gasped. K Kakashi-san, you shouldn't be up. The silver-haired man patted Naruto on the back. No worries, Tsunami-san. My kohai here made it all better. Tsunami looked at the blonde and smiled, if a bit apprehensive. Well, just take it easy, she said politely. Kakashi nodded. Of course. Sasuke sat back down and Sakura continued to help the woman with dinner. At least now we can rest easy. The copy inside. Even if Zabuzai isn't dead yet, it won't matter now since the bringer of hope has joined us. At those words, everyone froze, for several different reasons. Zabuzai's alive? Sakura shouted. Bringer of hope? Tsunami asked in amazement. That crazy demon still breathing? Wonderful. Dazuna slurred, taking another gulp from his bottle. This day just kept getting better and better. Naruto chuckled and Kakashi sighed. It looked like he had a lot of explaining to do. Kakashi spent a good half an hour explaining everything that needed to be discussed. Tsunami and Tazuna were starstruck when the Kapinin introduced the young blonde as the bringer of hope. Apparently his name even reached the small nations, and even the civilians knew quite a few of his accomplishments. Then Sakura felt sick when she was told that Kakashi thought Zabuza was still alive, even though he had felt no vitals, and his suspicions that the hunter Nin was actually his accomplice. Sasuke was a little excited to fight the Kiri fake, and couldn't wait to begin the special training their sensei promised them. After they ate dinner, Kakashi had assigned Naruto to accompany Tsunami to the marketplace the next day, just to make sure she wasn't used to bait Tazuna out by getting herself kidnapped. After a short conversation, the two Jonin joined the Jinan in sleeping. When Naruto woke, an hour before anyone else, he had been surprised to see Tsunami was already awake, and after the two had some tea that the woman made, they decided to get the shopping done sooner rather than later. 
So now Naruto and Tsunami walked side by side into town. The woman needed to buy extra ingredients for tonight's dinner since there were so many guests. Thank you for accompanying me, Naruto-san, Tsunami said for the fifth time. The woman was the most polite person he'd ever met. It's not a problem, Tsunami-san. Kakashi-senpai asked me to look out for you, and I've only been here once before, so I kind of wanted to look around and see the sights. Naruto replied. He really had only been to Nami no Kuni once, and it was only to pass through it, so he didn't get a real chance to see the actual villages. He was excited, until he saw how poor and depressing it was. Tsunami had seen his eyes wander around sadly, and decided to let him know why the small fishing village was in such a sorry state. However, before she could begin, there was a cry for help in a nearby shop. When the woman saw Naruto begin to walk towards Tanoi's, she tried to stop him. No, Naruto-san, it's too dangerous to get involved. She pleaded. It's most likely Gato's men, they force the shop owners to pay a protection tax, and if they don't, well. She didn't have to finish her sentence, the screams for help were enough. I'll be fine, Tsunami-san. Naruto explained. He walked into the shop to find three rough-looking thugs, each with a weapon of some kind, huddled around an older-looking man. He cleared his throat. Excuse me, but I'd really appreciate it if you leave the man alone. The apparent leader of the ragtag group didn't even turn his face when he spoke. Beat it brat, this doesn't concern you. After that was said he started poking his sorry excuse for a sword dangerously close to the man's neck. Before anyone knew exactly what happened, a real sword was shoved into the leader's throat, his crimson blood splattering on the other two. It concerns me now. The blonde whispered, his voice colder than winter. The two living thugs screamed in surprise. W what the hell? The one with a dull kunai shouted, bringing the kunai up to slam it in the kid's face. The blonde dropped his tanto and caught the man's arm in his hand, crushing it with his steel-like grip until it snapped like a twig under the pressure. The scum's cries of pain only brought a smile to Naruto's face. Fuck off, creep. The only unhurt thug shouted as he tried to free his wounded friend from the crazy-looking blonde. His sorry attempt at thrusting a rusty pocket knife at his back was evaded with ease. Naruto spun out of the blow, grabbing the wielder by the throat and slammed him into the wall of the shop, cracking it by the force of the collision. Now that we have that settled, Naruto said with a sadistic smile on his face, I'd like you to send your little boss a message. He leaned in close to the man he still had by the throat. He takes his last breaths. His smile grew even wilder. God has passed his judgment on him, he took the man and threw him out of the shop, and has decided to send his harbinger to cleanse Nami no Kuni of his filth. Give this message to Gato. He's been warned. With that said, he turned to the man whose arm was still broken. As for you, he picked his tanto back up, which he kept in a seal tattooed on his left arm, and pointed it at the man. It only takes one to deliver a message. The last thing the black-haired thug saw was the terrifying face of a monster. Gato Company had recently crossed Konoha, in what way Naruto wasn't told, because it didn't matter. The Hokage had ordered him to kill Gato while he was observing Kakashi, which was one of the reasons why he gave them this particular mission. It was a way to get the Kamikajin Nami no Kuni, and then he could end the little man's life. Like Yagura, Gato didn't fear Konoha or the Lord Third Hokage, and just like Yagura, he would see the foolishness in his sins. Naruto felt fear behind him, and he sighed. I'm sorry that you had to see that, Tsunami-san. He turned to face the woman who was trying her best to not look totally terrified. I know it's hard not to be afraid, but you have nothing to fear from me. He took a step towards the woman and was relieved that she didn't take a step back. He put his hand on the woman's shoulder. I'm here to protect you and your family, but to do that, I have to become a monster that our enemies will fear. Tsunami just nodded, still scared, but trusting the famous bringer of hope with his word. Now, let's get back to the main reason we came here, he said, motioning for her to continue her shopping. The rest of the trip was made in silence. Sometimes, being a monster meant doing the things that needed to be done, but at the cost of others distancing themselves from you out of fear. And that never felt good. Ever. Naruto was staring at the third member of Team 7 with something akin to a predatory gaze. The kid was very strange, and his lack of emotions was getting to the blonde. It amused him for a moment, and then it pissed him off. Donzo really underestimated them, and the Uzumaki was finding it irritating. Naruto knew that Sai, if that was his real name, was a member of Root, and the only reason he hadn't ripped the spy's throat out was because there was a little. He couldn't explain it, but there was something deep down inside the Jinan, something slumbering. Something that felt like emotion, something that felt like 
Anger. Naruto smiled, he could work with anger. The boy was asleep, and the Kamikage wanted to see the real Sai, when he was awake. Once Naruto had seen the real him he would ask his leader to pass judgment on him. If he wished for the boy's death, then he would be given his head. If he was told to spare him, then he wouldn't touch the Jinan, as was what the commander of God's army was expected to do. During his thoughts, Kakashi came up to stand next to him as they watched the Jinan practice the tree walking exercise. Oddly enough it was Sakura who completed the task first. The pink haired girl had exceptional chakra control, and was able to complete the task right away. Sai had pretended to struggle for a little while, which was just insulting to the blonde. He knew that if he was a root member then he would most definitely know how to cling to surfaces using his chakra. His act didn't fool him, or Kakashi. So you noticed, too? Kakashi asked, already knowing the answer. If he could tell on the first day, then he didn't doubt that his kohai knew the very second he stepped through the door of Tazuna's home. Yeah, Naruto said softly, watching Sasuke have trouble with the exercise. He could tell that the boy was annoyed that he looked incompetent in front of such a powerful figure like the bringer of hope, which made it all the more difficult for him since his concentration was split. And your decision? Kakashi asked. I want to wait and see something for myself, he admitted, never taking his eyes off Sasuke. After that, I'll ask Hokage Gigi what should be done. Kakashi nodded. He wasn't sure what was worth discovering about the boy, him having no emotions or will of his own at all, but if that's what his brother wanted, then he would give it to him. A few minutes later and Kakashi decided to go back to the house with Sakura and Sai since they had the tree walking exercise down already. Sakura wanted to stay, but Kakashi made it clear that she didn't have a choice. His explanation was that they needed to take Tazuna to the bridge and watch over him, but there was another reason why he wanted them both to leave. This was the perfect time for Naruto to talk to Sasuke, and Sai couldn't really report anything to Danzo except that they were alone together for a while which was bound to happen eventually since he was attached to Team 7 now. Naruto smiled and nodded to Izaniki for giving him his first time alone with the Uchiha. The blonde approached the raven-haired boy who was panting a little and just staring up at the large tree in front of him, trying to figure out the secret of sticking to it. Can I give you a few pointers? Naruto asked. Sasuke turned his head to the blonde and huffed. I don't need your help. He stood. I'm an Uchiha, I can do this on my own. He took the kunai in his hand that he used as a marker and ran at the tree. It was painfully obvious that he was using the wrong amount of chakra. He was probably doing so because he had no desire to launch himself off the tree and land on his head like he did the first time he used too much. The last Uchiha didn't even get halfway up the tree before he slashed at it and made his way down rather skillfully. I wasn't implying that you couldn't. Naruto smirked. I just thought you were mature enough to take the advice of a fellow Konohanian. I guess I was wrong. He began to leave, but was stopped by the Jinan. Wait, Sasuke sighed. I, he shook his head. I'm sorry. I'm just frustrated because both of my teammates got this within 20 minutes and I can't even stick to the tree for a few seconds. Naruto smiled, it was taking a lot for the Uchiha to admit this, and it showed him that the boy wasn't a complete stuck up like so many people said he was. Can I still, he looked to his left, not wanting to make eye contact with the blonde, get those pointers? He finished rather quietly, like what he was asking for was something to be ashamed of. Of course, Naruto said cheerily, a huge grin on his face. It's not as difficult as it seems, he continued as he got closer to the Jinan. I can show you a little trick Senpai taught me. Now standing in front of the Uchiha, Naruto couldn't help but smile. He looked like Itachi, and it reminded him of his first human friend. He wondered what Itachi was doing right now. He really hoped that he was okay, because he couldn't wait to see him again. He hoped that when they next met, Sasuke could be there with him, on their side instead of in the smothering darkness of hatred and revenge. If he wanted that to happen then there was much work to be done. Gato was very, very nervous. The short, stout man had thought he was untouchable with his growing monopoly of the shipping industry. His large arrogance was what led him to believe that, since he was such a rich man, said to be the richest in the world, then not even the prestigious Kanahagakura no Sato would dare touch him. The message the bringer of fucking hope sent him yesterday was proof enough that no one was out of their reach. It didn't matter how big the target, if God wanted someone's soul, he'd have it, and Gato was sweating profusely because he now knew it. He had no doubt in his mind that God's shadow would, and very much could, kill him. For God's sake, the boy was a cage slayer, responsible for the death of the fourth Mizukage. One was enough to earn the title cage slayer, since even one of them would have been extremely difficult to kill. So now here Gato was, 
constantly jumping whenever there was a sudden noise around him. Even though it was never the Kamikage, Gado still jumped and searched for what made the noise. He was paranoid, extremely so, and terrified out of his mind. What did he have to go and piss off a god for? He was an idiot for rerouting the raw materials shipment for Konoha to himself and Nami. He just wanted his men to be able to make high quality weapons, is all. Most of his thugs were walking around with dull knives and cracked swords, they really needed better materials. That's when his arrogance got the best of him. He had stolen from heaven, and now an angel of death was going to reap his soul. He was a fool to openly flaunt his trespasses on Konoha, and he understood now why they were the greatest village in the elemental nations. There was only a sliver of hope left for the shipping tycoon. After he had spoken to Zabuza, and that brat Haku who almost broke his arm, he had explained their predicament and was pleased to hear the man's plan. Hopefully, two previous seven swordsmen and this mystery partner would be enough for Gato to keep his life. Hopefully. After only an hour of practice, Sasuke was able to perfect the tree walking exercise. It was strange for the Uchiha to take advice from, well, anyone, but especially from someone as young as Naruto. He realized that his pride was only hindering him, but he just couldn't help himself. So when he was still in the forest with the blonde, he didn't really understand why he was so eager to cooperate and listen to him. Yes, he was known worldwide as one of the most powerful shinobi alive at the moment, but Sasuke didn't think that his willingness to learn from the bringer of hope was because of his reputation. After an hour of the tree walking exercise, Naruto had offered to teach the raven-haired boy how to walk on water. Apparently, it not only applied in battle, but also improved one's chakra control. Sasuke already had decent control, but he shared Naruto's enthusiasm in improving himself. With a blonde there it didn't take long for him to complete it. Only a few hours and Sasuke had learned more from the new Jonin than he had from his sensei in an entire month. If he wasn't so prideful he'd ask if they could train all the time together. It's getting late, Naruto said, standing from his prone position. The Konohanin decided to take a break, and it had already gotten dark. We should get back before we miss dinner. There was a sad look in his eyes. I don't want to give Tsunami-san any more reason to dislike me. Sasuke didn't know what he did to upset the woman, but he definitely knew that she looked at him differently after they came back from shopping the day prior. The Uchiha wasn't very good with sympathy, so he just replied with, HN. You know, Naruto started as the two began to walk back to Tazana's home. If you'd like, we can train together even after I'm attached to another team. He couldn't see it, but he could feel the Uchiha's eyes widen. Sasuke quickly composed himself. Sure, he said like it wasn't a big deal. Internally he was shocked. It was like the blonde knew what he wanted. Cool, Naruto said nonchalantly. If the Janan wanted to act like it was no big deal then so would he. He knew how the Uchiha thought, and the fact that he was able to get this much out of him was a miracle. The boy was prideful, and he wanted nothing more than to acquire power so that he could have his revenge. It angered, Naruto, more than anything, that the Janan's anger was misdirected. He was upset with the wrong person. His anger, his hate, it was all towards Itachi. Naruto couldn't wait until he was ready to learn the truth. When that time came, Donzo's days would be limited. The rest of the small walk back to the house was done in a peaceful silence. It didn't take long for the two to walk through the door of Tazuna's home, and when they did, they were greeted by an excited Sakura. You're back. She squealed happily. Dinner's almost ready. Naruto was amused with the girl's conviction. She actually loves Sasuke. Unlike Ino, Sakura, deep, deep down, cared for the boy on a more emotional level. Whereas Ino liked him for his coolness, Sakura just wanted the Uchiha to accept her, his popularity only being a small reason why she was attracted to him. Yes, she was definitely a fangirl, but Naruto could look underneath the underneath, and below all of that schoolgirl nonsense, there was someone who actually cared for Sasuke. Great. Naruto decided to answer since Sasuke just walked past the pink-haired girl and took a seat. He was going to change that attitude of his one way or another. Ignoring a teammate, no matter how obsessive he or she may be was not the Konoha way. Sakura's intentions were good, and Sasuke needed to look past the academy girl and try better to accept the budding Kunoichi. Of course, he definitely need to have a serious chat with the girl as well, because her fangirl behavior was just pushing her crush away. She didn't understand that Sasuke was all about power, so if she ever wanted the boy of her dreams to give her the recognition she craved, she needed to grow stronger as both a kunoichi and a woman. How was the training, Naruto-san? Did Sasuke-kun complete the exercise? Sakura asked excitedly. Yup. Sasuke-san was able to complete the tree-walking exercise, he gave a proud smile, 
and then I taught him how to do the same thing, but on water. The blonde found the pink-haired girl's reaction funny. First, she was happy. Then, when he smiled at her, her cheeks turned a few shades redder, Naruto kind of had that effect on people. After he mentioned that he taught the Uchiha how to walk on water, she was shocked. Why you taught him? How to walk on water? She asked disbelievingly. Naruto smirked, nodding his head. Yeah. It's a lot like clinging to trees, just a little more useful. She was still in shock. Apparently the girl had never seen or heard of someone walking on water before. It's a common practice, Sakura-san. All shinobi learn it during their Janan days. You, he gave Sai a look that said I know what you are, and Sai should be learning it pretty soon. I just taught it to Sasuke because we had nothing better to do. Sakura just nodded her head, still a little in wonder that shinobi walking on water was a normal thing. Naruto guessed that the young Kunoichi wasn't going to reply, so he took a seat next to Kakashi, who had just entered the room, his usual smut in hand. Ah, you're back. How did the training session go? The lazy pervert asked, his eyes never leaving his book. Naruto smiled. Jinan Uchiha Sasuke can now climb trees without the use of his hands and walk on water. He reported in a mock professional manner. Kakashi's one visible eye finally graced Naruto with its gaze. You taught him the water walking exercise as well? The blonde nodded. I appreciate the assistance, Kohai. You should help me train my cute little Jinan more often. Naruto smirked. His senpai was giving him even more opportunities to train Sasuke. You're very welcome, senpai. I would be honored to assist you with your Jinan in any way possible. He replied. A few minutes of idle chit chat later and dinner was ready. It smelled really good, and Naruto was starving. Tsunami's cooking was amazing, almost as good as Hayate's. The Uzumaki had gotten a lot closer to the Tokubatsu Jonin in the month he had lived with him, and he began to think that his cooking was too good for him to ever move out. And when they all ate together, he felt like he actually belonged somewhere. It was hard, protecting something so precious to you when the very thing you care for the most despised your very existence. Naruto loved Konoha, with every fiber in his body, but it still hurt, even to this day when he felt the minds and hearts of the villagers and all that was there was hate and loathing for him. Tsunami had just sat down, after serving everyone their plates, when Naruto felt depression and anger behind him. When he turned to see Inari, he sighed. You should just give up, the boy whispered. It wasn't soft enough to be unheard, but it wasn't loud enough to make a big impression. Still, Sasuke replied. What was that? He asked offhandedly. I said you should all just give up. There's no way you can stop Gato. He'll just kill you all, the boy snarled louder than before. He then turned to Naruto. You, he cried, pointing at the blonde. You're the famous bringer of hope, and even you haven't done anything to stop him. Your name's Elijah. You can't bring hope here because hope doesn't exist anymore. He lowered his head. Gato took that away, too. Inari, Tsunami shouted. Don't speak like that. She didn't want her son to have such a dark view on the world, but Naruto could tell that she was worried that he might hurt her son. He didn't show it, but that actually hurt him more than he would like to admit. You speak as if you've seen the ugly truths of the world. Naruto began as he stood. You speak as if you're not a young, naive, ignorant child. He was now standing in front of the boy. You know nothing of how I earned my titles. I've laughed in the face of a cage, and then I sent him to hell. He put his hand on Inari's head, and decided to ignore Tsunami's fearful emotions. I've freed a country five times bigger than Nami no Kuni. Naruto's eyes changed from blue to gold. I am the right hand of God, Inari. He then took in a deep breath. Hope is never out of my reach. Now glimpse, boy, he whispered. I'll let you have a glance of heaven. The whole room lit up in a bright gold light, everyone inside shielding their eyes formed the majestic shine. By this point Tsunami was in tears with how worried she was for her baby. When the light faded, Tsunami, Tazuna, Sasuke and Sakura gasped at what they saw. On his knees, with tears running down his face, Inari stared at Naruto with bright, molten gold eyes. Not just his pupils, they were nowhere in sight, but his entire sockets were alight with a mighty color. Inari? Tsunami shouted, rushing over to her child. She took him by the shoulders and panicked when he didn't see her and just kept staring at the blonde shinobi. W what did you do to my son? She asked in a shaky voice. Naruto could feel the other thing the black haired woman wanted to scream. Get away from us. Naruto's look made Kakashi's heart ache. I gave it back to him. Was all Naruto said before he walked out of the house, never even touching his plate. Gave what back to him? She cried back, but it was too late. 
Naruto was already gone. When she looked back down at her son, he was looking back at her with something she hadn't seen on his face since her husband was taken from them, a smile. Kakashi sighed as he stood. He walked towards the stairs. Hope, the copy nin answered for his kohai. Naruto gave Inari back his hope by letting him see the world through his eyes. With that said, Kakashi climbed the stairs, ready to sleep through the rest of the night. He knew his brother all too well, he would want to be alone for tonight. The entire time, Sai ate his meal with a fake smile on his face. He didn't open his eyes, but Naruto knew that someone was approaching him. This person was trying to decide something. This person was trying to decide whether or not to assassinate him. It was rather amusing if he were honest. This person thought they could actually take his life if they wanted to. It was a funny joke. The fact that the person was considering letting him live was the only reason he hadn't slit their throat. It was interesting, and Naruto wanted to see where this would go if he let the person decide for themselves. A few moments later and he could hear a female-like voice, which was strange since he could tell that the person was very much a male, and that he was the only person around. You shouldn't sleep out here, Shinobi-san. He could feel a hand tap his shoulder. You'll catch a cold. Naruto slowly opened his eyes. Apparently he decided to spare him. I think I'll be okay. Haku, the feminine looking boy answered the unspoken question. Haku. Naruto looked around before he sighed. I'm Naruto. So, what are you doing out here, Haku-san? He asked, getting to his feet. He didn't want to go back to Tezuna's house. He was going to respect Tsunami's wishes, even if she never expressed them. Her mind was clear, she didn't want him around her son anymore, and Naruto really didn't want to feel the way he felt last night again. He usually loved being a monster, embraced it even, but when the people he promised to protect looked at him like one, well, even a monster's heart could ache. Someone very dear to me is injured. Haku pointed to the herbs across the small clearing they were in. I'm looking for medicinal herbs so I can speed up his recovery. Haku gave the blonde a polite, kind smile. Naruto smirked. Ah yes, I heard. Kakashi really got Zabuza good the other day, huh? Haku's shocked face was humorous. The fake Kirinin stood and took out a senbone, getting in a defensive stance. I will return to Zabuza-sama, even if I have to kill you, he stated. Naruto just chuckled. If I wanted you dead, Haku-san, you would already be dead. The blonde stretched. Now, which herbs were you looking for? He asked, taking his time to walk over to where Haku had pointed. Why you? Haku was very, very confused. You want to help heal an enemy shinobi? This had to be some kind of joke, or a way to get his guard down. Right? Yeah. Naruto nodded. You see, I kind of need your assistance with something, so I thought, while you do what I need I could have some fun as well. His genuine smile confused the last Yuki even more. Fun? He asked, now very interested in what the boy had to say. Yes, fun. He replied, bending down to pick the herbs he knew to be medicinal. You see, I've been asleep for quite a while now, and I'm terribly curious about it. Curious about what? Haku asked. This Konohanin made no sense at all. Firstly, he had been fast asleep, ignorant to the possibilities of an enemy nin attack in a nation without shinobi. Secondly, he somehow knew that he was working with a well-known, A-ranked missing nin and didn't try to attack. Thirdly, he didn't try to stop him from collecting herbs, but even offered to help. And lastly, he wanted to have dot fun? What the hell was wrong with this kid? I want to know which is superior. Naruto stood, handing the boy the herbs he picked out, almost losing his composure when the fake hunter nin almost flanched. As he walked off further into the forest, he whispered his last words, but Haku heard them clearly, like nature itself went silent so his words could travel to his ears. A demon. Or a monster. After an unfruitful training session, Naruto decided to confront the little birdie following him. He gave the boy props for his skills and stealth, for a Janan at least. You can come out now, Sasuke, he said, not even looking towards the tree the Uchiha was in. The blonde was sitting on the shoreline watching the waves which reminded him of a certain auburn-haired woman. The forest behind him, more specifically the rather large tree, was where the Konoha Janan stood, trying his best to be inconspicuous. How long did you know? Sasuke asked, trying to act like he wasn't bothered at being discovered so quickly. Naruto smirked, not that the Janan could see it. Since you stepped out of Tazana's home, he could feel the boy's shock. I'm a censor, Sasuke, and a good one at that. He gave a small smile. What's on your mind? A pointless questions, since Naruto already knew what he wanted to talk about. Last night. The raven-haired boy paused, not sure if he should ask. 
What? What did you do? When he saw Inari's eyes he didn't know what to think. Then, when Kakashi said that he somehow gave hope back to him by letting him see through his eyes, Sasuke was interested in what he meant. Inari's eyes were back to normal now, but around the pupil there was a faint gold trace. My sensor ability comes from another technique I was born with. He turned to the Uchiha. It's called empathy, and with it I can understand others on a deeper, more personal level. The special thing about my gifts is that there is more than one way to use them. If I can make physical contact, I can push my empathy onto another, and let them see what I see when I look at the world. So, Sasuke began, since Inari saw through your eyes, he somehow obtained hope. I don't understand. How can someone see hope? Isn't it just a four-letter word, an emotion? Naruto shook his head. I could sit here and explain it to you all day, but I don't think you would understand. He felt the Uchiha's indignant mind. Relax, Sasuke, I know you're an intelligent shinobi, but even cage-level ninja can't properly contemplate what I'm capable of. He smirked. But if you'd like, he held out his hand, you can try to, with time. Sasuke took a moment to think the offer over. Ever since. What he did, all the last loyal Uchiha wanted was to gain the power to avenge his clan, to be powerful enough to end his brother's life. He didn't have time for friends. He didn't have time to train with others, because to Sasuke, everyone was below him. But now, standing in front of him, someone known to be the greatest shinobi in Hai no Kuni wanted to help. He only had one question. Why? He knew what a lot of people thought about him. He was the last Uchiha, not Uchiha Sasuke. He loved his clan, he wanted the world to know of their greatness, but he wanted to be seen as an individual sometimes. It's simple, really. Naruto began. When I was in the Anbu, I knew your brother. He felt Sasuke freeze. He was my first real friend in the village. His small smile morphed into something more sinister. You weren't the only one who lost a brother, a family that night. He steeled his features. With your help, Sasuke, I wanted to kill, no, I wanted to annihilate the person responsible, the person who took something very dear to us both. Naruto decided to ease the boy's mind. You're not just another Uchiha, there's greatness in your future. The drawback, though, is that there are two very different paths that lie before you. Without my assistance, it is very possible that you will fall into the dark abyss of hatred, forever falling in a never-ending pit of suffering. But with my help, with me there to guide you, to teach you, I guarantee you will be remembered long after your death. The name Uchiha Sasuke will be etched into history forever, not as a brave and courageous hero, but as one of the greatest monsters to have ever served heaven. His hand was still offered to the Jinan. So, what's it going to be? Will you let your heart ache, and struggle to gain the power you seek? Or will you join me in my crusade as one of God's monsters, his demon slayer, and his right hand? It was strange. Sasuke was never one to follow. He was never one to listen to orders, to serve. But at that moment, after hearing the most sincere thing anyone had ever told him, he felt like he could follow. He felt like he could, like he would, do as this blonde shinobi said. He shook the Uzumaki's hand. He would become a monster. And Naruto could feel his conviction. He was one step closer to being ready, and Donzo was one step closer to hell. He was almost insulted when he felt the fear and panic of Tsunami. Apparently Gato wanted hostages, and nothing screamed hostage like a helpless woman or a child. It disgusted Naruto that someone would take advantage of the innocent like this. This was why he loved taking the life of scum, they tainted the world, and needed to be cleansed. He was insulted because all the cowardly man sent was two very weak thugs, something a Jinan could handle easily. The fool still underestimated Konoha. That alone was enough for the bringer of hope to want his head. For a civilian woman however, they were probably intimidating and scary. Tsunami couldn't fight back for fear of her son getting involved. That woman was something else, really. She thought of her son first, before all else, even in the face of imminent death. She was a good person, and a great mother. For a fraction of a second, Naruto was jealous of Inari. Then, after he remembered who his mother was and what she had done for him, he decided that he was perfectly fine with his own mother, even if she was dead. Uzumaki Kushina was the greatest mother a boy could have. She was beautiful, smart, talented, and willing to die for her family. Naruto wouldn't trade her for the world. Just now exiting the house, Gato's men were dragging a crying tsunami off. The reason he wasn't down there this moment was simple, he wanted to see if her son would do anything. He was radiating bravery and courage the likes of which only someone who was willing to die could. At that moment, the ignorant child became a man, a warrior in the eyes of the Kamikage. Tsunami, 
Tazana, Olive Wave had just earned his respect, they had just earned their freedom, and all because of the courage of one boy. As he suspected, Inari ran out of the house, his hands balled into fists, a scared but brave expression etched into his face. He was going to save his mother or die trying, and that's all Naruto needed to see. He had no doubt that the boy would surely die, but it was the fact that he would do just that for the safety of his loved ones. Inari was, now, the kind of person the blonde respected above all others. He was someone who would stand against impossible odds for the sake of others. Someone who wasn't arrogant enough to think they could win, but brave enough not to care about things like surviving. Someone who would dance with death and smile, knowing that all that could be done, was. Someone like him. As Inari reached the two thugs, who had taken their weapons out to cut down the child, the men fell, their lifeless corpses now adorning two very shinobi-like kunai that weren't there a second ago. Inari was shocked all but two seconds before the same smile he had the other night crept back onto his face. He didn't do or say anything for a few moments, but after he took in a deep breath, he shouted to the heavens. Thank you, Narutoni. After Tsunami recovered from the shock of a failed abduction attempt, she couldn't help but cry again. This time, however, it was not tears of fear, or sorrow, these were tears of joy. Her baby, her beloved son hadn't smiled like that since Keiza was murdered. She smiled sadly and whispered. Thank you, Naruto-san. Her smile became a bright one. I'm not afraid anymore, she sighed and shook her head. I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. The Uzumaki could hear her. He could feel her. He was accepted, and he once again felt invincible. It was time to have some fun now. On the way to the bridge, Naruto felt him. He hadn't felt him in years, but he could never forget that chakra signature. Itachi, he whispered under his breath. What was he doing here? And who was he traveling with? His companion's chakra felt. Fishy, for lack of a better term. And it was large, larger than the reserves of most cage. Whoever he was, this man was dangerous, and he was traveling with Itachi, another extremely dangerous shinobi. That meant he was a member of the organization Itachi joined that Jiraiya was telling him about, the one he wasn't allowed to confront yet for some reason. Itachi may still be a loyal Konohanin and like a brother to Naruto, but he needed to keep his cover. He wouldn't like it. But right now, Itachi was the enemy, along with his companion. And they were headed towards Kakashi Senpai and Sasuke. There was no doubt in his mind that Itachi would kill Kakashi if it was necessary to keep his cover intact. First friend or not, Kakashi would not be taken from him too, he wouldn't allow it. He needed to have a chat with, what was it? The Akatsuki? Yeah, it was time to send the Akatsuki a message. It took him a few minutes to cut the two ninja off, and Naruto now knew who the fishy, literally, man was. So, the Uzumaki's voice called out to the two black cloaked men, Gato hired 2s rank missing nin 2, what? Kill me? He asked in an amused voice. TSK, TSK. He shook his pointer finger along with his head. The two of you are way out of your league here. The aforementioned missing nin turned to the blonde. Now, I'm kind of busy, so if you apologize for wasting my time, I'll let you live. For now. He crossed his arms to wait for their response. Kisame, Itachi started with his calm and collected facade, your contact wanted us to confront Konoha's Kaumikage? The shark-faced man turned to his partner. He never gave me a name. All he said was that he needed our organization to eliminate someone for him. He promised a hefty price as well. Itachi's eyes never left Naruto's. He had his Sharingan active, like usual, and was ready to activate the Mangekyo if needed. They weren't enemies, not really, but Naruto would not let them pass without something close to an all-out war between them. The blonde was never one to just let possible threats walk by, and Itachi was sure that Naruto knew of his cover, so he wouldn't want that blown either. Itachi deduced all of this in a second, just by looking into his friend's eyes. Nonetheless, the Uchiha began, we can no longer help your contact for more than one reason. When Kisame frowned and turned his gaze to the blonde, Itachi went through Unbu code faster than most could see. What of Sasuke? And I need Kisame alive, or our leader might retaliate. Naruto read it loud and clear. And what are those reasons, Itachi-san? Kisame asked. The one thing he liked about being teamed with the Uchiha was that he was quiet, polite, and skilled, more so than himself. He was the perfect partner, so he showed the youngest member of their team the respect he deserved. Leader Sama has stated that the Jinchuriki are off limits. Have you already forgotten? He pointed at Naruto. And more importantly, a fight with this guy would result in our deaths. 
We are not ready to fight an opponent of his caliber yet, Naruto chuckled. He wasn't bullshitting either, Itachi was telling the gods honest truth. He doesn't look like much to me, Kisame said with a smirk. And Seimata is begging to feast on his chakra. Ah, yes. Naruto suddenly shouted, his right hand meeting his left palm. Hoshigaki Kisame, former member of the Seven Swordsmen of Kirigakure, he chuckled darkly. You're called the Tailless Tailed Beast. Such an absurd title, don't you think? The Kiri missing Nin's annoyed mind made Naruto want to chuckle again. No, I don't think it's absurd. He grabbed the hilt of the shark's skin. So, boy, would you like to see why I was given that title? Kisame asked cockily. Unless you're scared, I mean, there are two of us and you're... Well, you're all alone. Here we go. Itachi thought. He knew that was not something that should have been said. Before Naruto could speak, Kisame flared his chakra, the enormity of it being felt by everything nearby. It was huge, and very powerful, there was no doubt about it. It was a presence worth noting. The pressure of his chakra was a visible thing, pushing down on the environment in a display of power that would surely be terrifying. For a mortal. I'm never alone, Naruto whispered. With his Sharingan, Itachi was able to catch a pair of eyes morph from blue to gold, and circular pupils became slit in ones. He was able to catch something he hadn't seen in five years. Naruto's monstrous smirk. His senpai was awake. God help them all. Zabuza was in a death match with Atake Kakashi when he felt the huge chakra signature of arguably the most powerful man who ever joined the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. It caused everyone on the bridge to pause for a second, the powerful wave of chakra washing over them, demanding recognition. He smirked, with Kisame and his partner here, he could fight Kakashi one-on-one -on -one without being interrupted. Everything was going as planned. Haku was fighting the two male Janan, and the little female one was defending his target. Once he was done with the copy nin, he could kill the pink-haired weakling and then the bridge builder. Gato would pay them and then they could leave this poor, dirty country. Everything was going his way, until something. Something not human responded to Kisame's powerful chakra. It was. It was like Kisame's might was an infant, the cries of a newborn. What responded could only be described as godlike. It stopped the hearts of everyone on the bridge. It brought them all to their knees, taking their breath away. It actually pushed down on them, commanding them to submit to its will. Like it was omnipresent, like the entire world could feel it. It was the most terrifying thing any of them had ever felt. The dome of ice Haku had trapped Sasuke and Sai and shattered from the pressure, the density of whatever it was. Dazuna and Sakura were having an incredibly difficult time staying conscious, the enormity of whatever was bearing down on them almost too much for them to handle. Sasuke was so lost in it that he didn't notice his vision enhance, or how his eyes changed from onyx to crimson. Sai had thought his emotions were erased, that he couldn't feel anything anymore. Oh, how very wrong he was. Right now, with it pushing down on him, he felt fear. He was afraid. Had. Had God decided to walk among them? because this absolutely could not originate from a human being. This was out of the realm of mortals. This power, this otherworldly chakra was something so far from human that no one could comprehend it. It was. So strong, so scary, but at the same time. It was beautiful. It was so warm, so bright, like the sun. It was almost too hard to explain. Or, maybe it wasn't. Maybe, it could be explained in one word. Impossible. This feeling lasted for no longer than 5 seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. When it stopped, everyone took in a much needed breath, even the Jonin. They were all out of breath, and the young shinobi were shaking. Hell, Zabuzo had to consciously keep himself from shaking. Kakashi wasn't shaking because he knew exactly where that chakra had originated from. What the hell was that? Zabuzo asked no one in particular. Kakashi let out a long breath. That, Zabuzo, was the end of our fight. Zabuza narrowed his eyes. I'm no longer your opponent. The moment he finished his sentence, Naruto, acting like nothing was wrong in the world, flickered into existence next to his brother figure. Yo! The blonde gave Zabuza a smile and the peace sign. Zabuza, I'd like you to meet Uzumaki Naruto, the bringer of hope. Kakashi announced. Zabuza's eyes widened. What about, Naruto cut him off. Kisume? He thought he could challenge me in a game of chakra. He smirked. You might have felt it. He stretched and cracked his back. I think you can tell who won. He looked at Kakashi. All right, I got it from here, senpai. You should see how the others are doing. Kakashi nodded. Right. Let's see how my Q Janan are doing after your little stunt. 
He shook his head in exasperation. Was that really necessary? Naruto gave a smile and shrugged. I don't like holding back, senpai, Kakashi sighed and walked off towards Sasuke and Sai, muttering something about all powerful teenagers. All right, now, we can settle this in two very different ways, Zabuza. He held up one finger. The first way, we simply fight. And you die, with your accomplice. I'd rather not do that though, so I came up with option two, my personal favorite. He held up two fingers. You and I play a game. The loser has to do whatever the winner wants. This way, neither side needs to lose a life. What do you think? Zabuza just stared at the blonde in front of him for a good minute, trying to decide if the boy was serious. After what he felt, after what everyone felt, he knew the kid could kill both him and Haku with ease. So why was he offering an option where they could survive? It was worth looking into. What kind of game? He asked. He wasn't a big fan of playing, but it couldn't hurt to ask, he hoped. Naruto smiled. Well, the way I see it, you're a suit and user, right? Zabuza nodded. Then the game's simple, whoever can create the greatest suit and jutsu wins. Oh, and Sutin is not my primary affinity, but I won't lie to you, I'm pretty good at it. The blonde gave him a questioning look. So, does that sound like something you'd like to do? The missing nin smirked under his wrappings. Sure, why not? He responded. Naruto wanted to laugh. Zabuza thought he had the win in the bag. Again, someone else would learn to never underestimate him. Okay then, Naruto started. You can go first. Bring out your most powerful Sutin Jutsu. Just don't attack anyone with it. Zabuza nodded, and began to run through a lot of hand seals. When he was finished, he shouted the name of his b rank Jutsu. Sutin, Suiyuden no Jutsu, Water Release, Water Dragon Bullet Technique. Water from below shot up and formed into a giant, powerful dragon. Naruto almost huffed. He was almost insulted again. A b rank Ninjutsu. That's all Zabuza was going to use against someone like him? He just shook his head and sighed. Whatever. He took in a deep breath. I've never tried to add water to this, but I think I can pull it off. Sasuke, Sai, Sakura, Tazuna, and Kakashi all watched closely for what the blonde was going to do. And Sasuke was still paying so much attention to Naruto that he hadn't yet realized what he had unlocked, what Naruto had given him. Zabuza noticed the Kamikage's eyes change from blue to gold, and felt his chakra skyrocket. Senpo, Sutin, the water underneath the bridge shot up in a giant pillar reaching into the sky past what the eye could see, Tengoku Kurito, Sage Art, Water Release, Heaven's Creed. A blast of golden light could be seen within the pillar of water, and with the light, a warrior, made completely of water, that was five times larger than an average sized man was created. The gold light was now seen in its head, constantly spinning. Huge, angel-like wings, made of water as well, adorned its back, keeping it in the sky above the blonde. The control to shape and keep the form of the warrior was beyond anything Zabuzo had ever heard of. It was so detailed, so fierce looking. It was incredible, but how useful was it? Naruto felt the question on Zabuzo's mind. I'm not done yet, Zabuzo, he whispered, but the man heard what he said. A second golden blast was seen from the pillar, and a second angel looking warrior made completely out of water was created. One was incredible, but two was impossible. There was no way the blonde could split his concentration in half like that. Just one would require a cage-level shinobi to create. The boy's smirk unnerved the demon. A third blast, a third water-made warrior. A fourth, a fifth, again and again golden blasts rang out on the bridge, and not just one at a time, but multiple at once. When Zabuza was sure that he was finished, there had to be a hundred warriors, no, these were not simple creations of water. Zabuza knew what these were before the blonde spoke his next words. They're sentient, you know, he said offhandedly while looking at his creations. Every last one of them is able to think for themselves, and they each follow my will. The monster looked the demon in the eyes. You should feel grateful, Naruto began. You're the first person to witness the army of heaven and survive. Zabuza let his jutsu go, the water raining harmlessly down on everyone on the bridge. All right, Zabuza whispered. You win. What is it you want? There was no point in arguing, no point of trying to fight his way out of his current situation. Not with an army of water made angels staring at him like the demon he was. I want you and Haku to promise me a few things. The missing nin was confused. The first thing, I want you to leave Nami no Kuni, and forget about Gato and his job for you. Zabuzo hated giving up on a job, but he didn't really have a choice right now. The second thing, 
I want you and Haku to go back to Mizu no Kuni. The demon was going to protest before Naruto stopped him. You probably know that the civil war is over already, and that Terumi Mei is the Lady Fifth Mizukage. I helped her end the war, Zabuza. She, and most of the resistance, understand why you tried to pull off a coup. They'll accept you back, you have my word. Naruto knew that Zabuza thought that even with Yagura dead, Kiri would probably never welcome him back, but that wasn't the case. Naruto knew that Mei would appreciate having a member of the Seven Swordsmen in her ranks again, and with the Bringer of Hope's recommendation, both he and Haku would have a place in Kirigakur. Why do you care if we go back to Mizu anyway? He asked, very confused why Akonaha Nin would care what happened to Akiri Nin. The Mizukage. Naruto started. She's. A friend. I want you to give me your word that you'll protect her for me. I can't be there for her like I want to, so I want you to watch over her in my place. I want you to be her right hand, someone she can trust with anything. Zabuza was still confused, but accepted nonetheless. And the last and most important thing, I want you to treat Haku the way he deserves to be treated, the way you really feel about him. Again, Naruto stopped him from interrupting. I have the ability of empathy, Zabuza. It's too late, I already see you. He's like a son to you, and if you don't start treating him like one, you're going to lose him. All he wants in the whole world is to be important to you. He just wants your dreams to come true. To be honest, you don't deserve that boy, but I'm not going to take you away from him. He looked at the boy he was talking about. That would be too cruel. You're his everything, his reason for living. He turned to look back at Zabuza. Promise me that you won't treat him like he's nothing but a tool. Promise me that you'll treat him the way you really feel about him. You owe him that much. Zabuza was staring at the ground, really listening to the Kamikage. He. He knew he loved Haku like his own son, it was just difficult for him to admit it. He didn't think he could be a good father, but. The blonde was right. Haku deserved for him to at least try. He raised his head, a look of determination on his face. Yes. That one word and that one look was all Naruto needed for him to know that Zabuza would do what he asked. In the man's mind, Naruto had given him a second chance to start over, to live a life with. With someone he could call family. Good. You're free to go then. Take your son and go home, Naruto said with a smile. Zabuza nodded and headed over towards Haku. As the two walked away, Naruto couldn't hear what was said, but the feeling of the absolutely happiest heart was clear as day. Hopefully, Haku could learn how to be a person, a son and not just a tool. The blonde sighed. Here he was acting like the hero again. Kakashi walked up to him, Sasuke, Sakura, and Sai close behind. It was the Uchiha who first spoke. What the hell was that feeling before you showed up? He paused. Was. Was that you? Naruto just smirked, but looked at Kakashi when he spoke. Yeah, sorry about that. I kind of ran into a couple of red clouds on the way over. The thing about red clouds though, sometimes, you run into ones that you know. He knew that Kakashi understood. And sometimes, you run into ones who think they're your better. The three Janan plus Tazuna were utterly confused. Naruto sighed and rubbed the bridge of his nose. Never mind, let's just say. He paused for a second, trying to figure out a way to best describe what they felt without telling them the whole truth. That's when it hit him. It was hope, Sasuke. That's what I showed Inari the other night. All of you just got the more direct approach, because instead of seeing it, you felt it. Sakura, Sai, and Tazana were still confused, but Sasuke somewhat understood. Hope was not just a four-letter word, it wasn't just an emotion. It was a promise. A promise that only people like Naruto could give, a promise that the monster would always be there to protect you. Sasuke wanted to be a monster more than ever now. Great. Naruto smirked. I was hoping he'd come to me. Now even Kakashi was confused, until he turned around and saw a rather short man who was on the chubby side. He was dressed in an all-black suit, had black glasses on, and carried a black cane. So, Gato announced himself. Looks like you're the only ones left. An army of thugs stood behind him, trying to act tough in the face of Shinobi. It's just too bad they didn't look up. Before Naruto could command anything, he felt it. It was beautiful. It was the reason he didn't mind being the monster in the end. He was no hero, but the small boy leading the entire island to Gato and his men, he was a hero. They were young and old alike, all of them sick of Gato's treachery. United under one boy's courage, one boy's bravery, Nami no Kuni would fight back. The Kamikage was never needed. There was already a hero in Wave, he was just slumbering. His name is Inari, and he was awake now. 
Stop where you are, Inari shouted towards Gato and his men. Naruto smirked. This Inari, this brave kid was going places. If he was a shinobi, Naruto could already see the good he would have done. This island is our home. The citizens wore makeshift armor out of house appliances and their weapons were no different. They weren't skilled fighters, but they were many in number. Naruto was a little amused that no one had looked up yet. One step further. Inari, Dazanawa whispered to himself. All of you, he whispered again. Scanning the crowd. Everyone was there. His grandson had rallied the entire island. He couldn't help but turn his gaze onto the blonde standing in front of him. He may be a drunk, but he was no idiot. Uzumaki Naruto had brought hope to his home. He really was the bringer of hope. You'll die where you stand. He finished, his eyes lit with a fire Naruto knew all too well. There was a silence on the bridge, an almost palpable one, the kind that stung the ears. It was interrupted by a disgusting noise. Gato laughed. You, whatever the man was about to say was cut short. Don't laugh at them, Naruto said softly, but somehow, it was heard throughout the bridge, like even the heavens went silent. What was that? He asked cockily. Naruto chuckled. Gato had thought the bringer of hope was done away with. He had no idea that he was in the presence of a cage slayer. I said, the Uzumaki's eyes were still a molten gold, and they only had Gato in their sights. Do. Not. Laugh. A cold, terrifying shiver ran across the backs of all present. Gato gulped. He didn't know why, but he gulped at the blonde kid's words. Naruto took in a deep breath. People of Nami no Kuni, he shouted, getting the attention of everyone. When I first arrived in this country, all I sensed was fear, and depression, like all hope was lost. A low growl came from his throat when he felt Gato's smug mind. This country has no shinobi force, no one to count on if it was in need. Gato smirked. That is no longer the case. Gato's smirk disappeared. For those of you who don't know, he looked Gato in the eye. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. And I am Konoha's Kamikage. Many gasps were heard across the bridge, and Gato almost pissed his pants. As second in command of Konoha, I declare Nami no Kuni an official ally of Kanahagakura no Sato. Dazu now widened his eyes, just staring at the boy. And Naruto-san. We don't have anything to offer you, the bridge builder was stopped. The price for this treaty is simple enough. Open trade with our country, and a 2% discount for our people. Dazu now was going to protest that there was already going to be open trade, and that 2% wasn't really any better than whole price, but stopped when Naruto gave him a look that said I know. Why you can't do that? Gato screamed. Just because your nation is big doesn't give you the right to stick your noses in where it doesn't belong. He pointed at the blonde. You can't just do what you want. This is my country. Naruto turned to the businessman, giving him a look that thoroughly scared him. Shut up, he said, turning back to the wave citizens. I was told that the fisherman Keiza was your hero. Inari held his head up high, respecting the memory of his best friend and stepfather. I can feel the minds of some of you here. He let his eyes roam the crowd. I am no hero. He brought his gaze to Inari. The real hero is standing at the head of your people. All eyes found Inari. A child, a civilian, a bridge builder's grandson, Naruto started. This boy, no, this man, united a hopeless people. He's no shinobi, he has but one power. He smiled. Courage. Naruto did something he only ever did for his god. Uzumaki Naruto closed his eyes and gave Inari a deep bow. You're my hero, Inari. He stood back up, staring at the boy. You and I are the same. He walked over to the boy, noticing how he was trying to hold his tears back. When he reached him, he put his hand over the boy's heart. You're a bringer of hope. Inari didn't close his eyes, or scrunch up his face, but the tears began to fall. And if you don't mind sharing the title, I'd like for you to take it up with me. Inari nodded his head vigorously. Good. He looked at the people of Wave. Citizens of Nami no Kuni, I give you the hero of Wave, Inari, the bringer of hope. The shouts of joy and happiness could be heard throughout the island. Naruto bent down to whisper in Inari's ear. Like father like son, he whispered what Jiraiya always told him. The tears increased. Now. Naruto turned to Gato. You should all return home. A monster is about to have his way with Gato. He felt the defiance in the crowd. He understood. They needed to see this then. W wait. Gato was terrified. Is this about the materials shipment? He was breathing hard. I I'll give it be back to you. He started walking backwards, trying to hide behind his hired thugs. Get me out of here, he shouted at them. Kill them. Kill them all. 
The thugs were scared, but more than that, they were arrogant and uneducated. It was time they learned. Before they could take a step, Naruto began. You defy heaven. You defy God's will. He brought his hand into the air. Now burn in hell. The thugs turned their eyes to the sky, and when they saw the hundreds of. Were those angels? All they felt was desperation. It was the end. All of you, he whispered, bringing his hand down, signaling his army of angels to descend upon the wicked. When the water made angels met the group of thugs, it ended quickly. They were slaughtered. Every last one of them were slain without hesitation, all but Gato. He stole from heaven. He ruined a country for his own desires. He would be given what he deserved. He would die like Keza. They say an eye for an eye will make the world go blind. Naruto gave a monstrous smile as he walked through the wake of dead bodies towards a shivering Gato. Then it was a good thing that Naruto didn't need sight to see. That's it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on my other social media accounts. Anime God here, and I'm signing off.